Hello, welcome. A very warm welcome to our very first Bipolar UK virtual conference. My name's Simon Kitchen. I am the Chief Exec of Bipolar UK and I'll be joining you on your journey today into a, gaining a better understanding of Bipolar and what we do as a charity and how we can transform the lives of everyone who's living with Bipolar in the UK. So I'd like to say a few Warm well, welcomes, welcome to all of you old timers who have been with the charity for a number of years, who have been part of our support groups, who have been part of our e-community and who have been coming to uh, our conferences previously. It's really lovely to have you back. And I'm sorry that it's been so long before we could join together like this. Um, I'd also like to be able to um, welcome all of the newbies as well. Um, you've probably seen an advert on our website or on our on our um, Facebook feed, uh, but we're we're a charity who's um, likes to represent the full diversity of our community, and we're we're really pleased that you've joined us here today. Bipolar affects everyone, regardless of their their background, their ethnicity, their religion, their sexuality, their gender, their sex, and our charity really tries to to reflect the full lived experience of the condition. And we really hope that today there'll be something for everyone who's living with bipolar and those who are affected for, by it through close friends and family. So um, in terms of what you can expect today, I think the um, obvious thing which we need to expect is uh, things are going to go wrong. Um, inevitably with technology, all of you have been using our um, using Zoom over the last year. And you've probably had some experiences of people being muted or unmuted and had lots of feedback. So I'll, I'll first of all start by apologising on behalf of everyone for things that go wrong. I've said to all of the speakers, just enjoy yourself. And I hope, really hope that you will do as well. I've got myself a, a nice cup of tea here. So I'll be keeping calm and carrying on. And I really hope all of you dialing in here today will just enjoy the sessions. And if anything goes wrong, then we'll be we'll be able to um, do follow up sessions with any of the speakers if any of the sessions break down. If for whatever reason your link doesn't work, just click the refresh button and that should solve most of any any problems you might have with connectivity. So all the caveats out of the way, we can now move straight on to talking about what an exciting agenda we've got for you. Well, first of all, we're going to be launching the Bipolar Commission and hearing from two really amazing people, uh, Dr. Claire Dolman, who's been uh, some uh, woman, amazing woman living with bipolar who's been a driving force for change for our community for several several years now. Also going to be joined by our other co-chair of the Bipolar Commission, uh, Professor Guy Goodwin, who's one of the leading psychiatrists and academics in bipolar in the UK and even across the world. So they'll be, they'll be launching our Bipolar Commission. We're then going to hear from um, Sir Norman Lamb. Sir Norman Lamb was the uh, uh, health minister during the coalition and was a leading force in terms of improving mental health in this country. He's also someone that drove forward the very first uh, cross-governmental suicide prevention plan. Most importantly, though, he's currently the chair of uh, the South London and Maudsley Mental Health Trust, or SLAM, as it's known uh, within the sector, uh, which is one of the biggest mental health trusts in the country. So he's currently one of the, the national health leaders uh, for people with bipolar. He's going to be interviewed by the indomitable, amazing Leah Charles King, who's been such a powerful ambassador for Bipolar UK and everyone living with bipolar, not just in the UK, but, but across the world. And she, she's an amazing woman, uh, been, on a, a fame, been an R&B artist. She's been on CITV. She was recently on The One Show. So it should be a really great discussion between Norman and Leah. We're then going to have a very short break. Get yourself another cup of tea. And we'll be going into breakout sessions. Um, all these breakout sessions will be on will be on Zoom, except for the main one, which will be on the, the preliminary one, which is on research. Again, most of these sessions will be will be recorded. Um, so if you're not able to go to the one that you the, um, you know, there's multiple ones you want to go to, you'll be able to to watch um, the other ones you're not able to on catch up. Um, except for the work and learning one, which there might be confidential information shared, so that that won't be recorded. Again, if anything goes wrong, just dial into the main plenary session and you'll have some great content there. Um, during the break, we're gonna be able to hear from uh, an amazing uh, artist living with bipolar, Eugene, who's gonna be um, talking about how he's uh, used the medium of art to be able to, uh, to communicate uh, his condition with other people in different communities. So that should be a really great session if you want to stick with us. Um, otherwise, during the break, you're more than welcome to, 
So go and refill your cup of tea or coffee or get yourself a bite to eat as well. Um, we're then going to be having in the afternoon, at the end, we'll be having some panel discussions where we'll be hearing from people with lived experience and academics um, about whether things have changed for people with bipolar. Are they getting better or are they getting worse? What about treatments? What about stigma? And then we're going to finish off just thinking positively about the future. It's been a really difficult year for all of us, in particular people living with bipolar. And for the first time, mental health is really at the forefront of people's agenda. And everyone now understands to some extent what it's like to be able to live with, with a mental health issue. Um, no one quite knows what it's like to live with bipolar, but certainly the wisdom that our community has in terms of being able to recover from mental illness is probably pretty much in parallels. We are, the people living with bipolar are the Olympic athletes of the mental health world in terms of what you're able to live with and survive. And I think there'll be some really amazing learning coming out of that session that we think will be good benefit people with bipolar, but also the wider community as we come out of this lockdown. So it should be a really great day. And I really hope that you stick around for the for the full for the full afternoon that we've got planned for you. Um, unfortunately, we we have been brought together in, in very tragic circumstances. It's it has been an incredibly difficult year for so many of us. And um, we were able to put this conference on. The only reason why we we're able to put this conference on for free was because of an incredibly tragic um, circumstance which happened in the autumn where we lost one of our valued members of our community, a really wonderful woman called Caroline, who was living with bipolar and, and tragically completed suicide. It was the huge effort of her family that came together to raise a huge amount of money for, for this charity that really wanted to, to make sure that, was, that money was going to go towards something that would enable thousands of people with bipolar to be able to, to find out about self-management and to get involved in the charity. And we decided to put this conference on for free. So it is really thanks to, to Caroline's family and that we're putting this conference on. And we, we would like to share with you their, their story and their, their memory of Caroline. So um, if you bear with us, we'll just put a, a short clip on now. Hi, I'm Prue, um, and this is my brother-in-law, Tim. Hi. Um, we'd like to share our story with you today about my sister Caroline's experiences with bipolar and how we want to continue to support bipolar and the invaluable work that they do. Uh, my wife Caroline was diagnosed with bipolar at the age of 19 uh, after an episode at Durham University. For the most part, Caroline was able to live really well with bipolar. Uh, we lived in London and then moved to Switzerland where we had two children, Millie and George. Uh, we lived in Switzerland for 10 years. Uh, Caroline was a fantastic mum, a brilliant wife and the life and soul of every social engagement we ever went to. Caroline loved sport. Uh, she excelled at hockey and netball at school. Um, she was a county tennis player, which was a sport she loved throughout her life. Uh, she was also a courageous skier, um, a passion she was able to indulge living out in Switzerland. Caroline really lived life to the full with so many happy memories. She had a close and supportive group of friends and family, both in Switzerland and the UK, where she and her family returned in 2019. Bipolar is cruel, it doesn't discriminate, and Caroline battled with it while healthy and while suffering from the various episodes over the years, which unfortunately often led to hospitalisation. As a family, I think we were guilty of burying the illness and convincing ourselves that Caroline did not face daily battles. In part, due to her own stubbornness and desire to be normal, we live life without properly acknowledging the illness. Ultimately, Caroline's diagnosis proved terminal, and sadly, in September last year, the burden of living with the disease became too much for her, and she took her own life. There are many things that we would all change, but most crucially for me would be to try and understand bipolar more and how it impacts lives 24-7. In many ways, it is easy to cope with the headline episodes, the extreme depression or mania, but it is much more difficult to understand that the illness is omnipresent and needs constant attention. Much work needs to be done to educate the person with the illness, but almost as important is to educate and support their family and those closest to them. We were aware of Bipolar UK before Caroline's death. She had sub subscribed to the newsletter uh, since 2015. My niece, Millie, while in the grips of her own grief, was keen that we did something to help others suffering as mummy did. 
a bipolar diagnosis doesn't have to end the way that it did for Caroline. We want to support Bipolar UK in their endeavours to ensure that bipolar sufferers live well and fulfil their potential. We set up a fund to raise money in Caroline's memory and so far have raised over £35,000. Caroline's friends have shown a huge amount of support too. And with, there are two currently raising money on a virtual cycle ride from Sus um, Switzerland to Sussex. We reached out to Bipolar UK after Caroline's death to find out more about the work that they do and to see how we can continue to support them. The charity is making great strides in the fight against bipolar, but needs far more attention in the broader world of mental health. The launch of the Bipolar Commission is a project that really resonated with us. Sadly, we both feel and our family that Caroline was let down by the health service in the three months leading up to her death. She was discharged from hospital far too early, which led to a readmission and in our opinion, unduly protracted her episode. We hope the findings from the Commission lead to positive change in bipolar treatment within the healthcare system so that others can feel more supported and understood when tackling bipolar. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Tim and Prue, for, for sharing Caroline's story. And I really hope that we can honour her memory today with a, with a really excellent conference. Um, suicide and bipolar is the real curse and burden that our community has to, to has to carry with it. And I think all of us, when we when we think about bipolar and we think about the impact of suicide, we'll have someone close to us that we that we think about. Um, me personally, I would like to share that we lost one of our amazing co-facilitators uh, last year, um, a gentleman called uh, Peter Fryer, who had done amazing work within um, within Torbay, uh, running his group there. He was a really fantastic character who had so much energy and drive, uh, went about his way helping others um, and really transformed uh, healthcare there as well in terms of the improvements in hospital care he was able to, to bring about. He was a really amazing man and he had some really bad news on his physical health, which uh, unfortunately resulted in, in him completing suicide. For me personally, um, within my family, I lost my brother-in-law, Kevin. I never got to meet him. Um, he was an amazing man as well. He had been trained by Jamie Oliver in the 21 uh, TV series and was a trained chef. And he had a really bright future ahead of him. And he lost his life to bipolar as well. Bipolar is a particular burden for so many people across the UK. And suicide is perhaps the, the most um, most devastating manifestation of that. We don't quite know how many people with bipolar complete suicide, but we think the lowest estimate is it's around about 10% of the population. 10% of all suicides are directly related to bipolar. Some estimates put it up to around about 50% of all suicides. It is a truly horrendous statistic that we as a charity are determined to change. I think it's important though to acknowledge given the year that we've had, given the number of people that we've lost over the last year, that we come together for a minute silence to be able to remember the friends and family who we've lost to bipolar and to COVID-19 within our community over the last year. So if you just join me now for a minute silence, I'd much appreciate it. Thank you. And perhaps one of the most devastating things about the level of suicide within our community is that all of these lives can be saved. There is nothing inevitable about anyone with bipolar completing suicide. If you think about anyone who's a diabetic, 
when they have to go into diabetic shock, there's a plan that's put in place to enable them to keep safe. The same way that there's services in place to be able to support them so they don't get to the point where they have a diabetic shock. It's exactly the same for bipolar. Suicide and bipolar is because of chemicals in the brain that mean that people have suicide ideation, suicidal thoughts that can pass with support. And with the right care and support, those thoughts don't need to come about at all. It is absolutely horrendous that our, our community should be subject to such high rates of suicide and such a lack of support that drives people to that situation. And that's why we're setting up our Bipolar Commission to really change that. Our Bipolar Commission is going to be asking some really difficult questions of the health service to make sure that they're fully playing their part in being able to enable everyone with bipolar to live well. We can't say that we have a national health service unless it supports and treats everyone with our within our great nation equally. And at the moment, too many people with bipolar just don't get any support or care at all. We're going to change that. There are some great injustices. Why on earth is it that if bipolar is one of the leading causes of suicide within our country, that, that all the national suicide prevention plans make barely any reference to bipolar itself? That is something that we need to change. Why is it that there are so many treatments out there that are readily available for people with bipolar, but they can't get access to it? Lithium. If people are taking lithium, one in three people with bipolar dramatically reduce their risk of suicide, almost down to the national average. Yet it's only one in 20 people with bipolar are taking lithium. That's something we need to change. And there are many other treatments out there that people with bipolar could benefit from. We also know that the prevalence is going up. The best studies that we have, um, a couple of years out of date, but they show a really worrying trend. Amongst the general population, one in 50 people are living with bipolar. That's almost a million people in the UK. But amongst 16 to 24 year olds, it's almost one in 30. Why is it with a condition which is almost doubling every couple of generations that there's not more uh, concerted effort or alarm bells ringing across government to take, take concerted action on this? We're going to change that as part of this commission. I think there's been two barriers to us being able to achieve the, the change that we want to. And that's why I hope with this commission and the work that we're sharing with you today in our conference, we'll be able to change and overcome those. The first one is that there's too much self-stigma within our own community. People with bipolar and those around them, well, people with bipolar mo mostly tend to be far too hard on themselves and blame themselves for the things that have happened in their lives. It is not your fault that you're unwell and that you've never had the care and support or been given the ability or, or the opportunity to self-manage well. But it's so important that none of us accept the low quality and standard of care that people with bipolar have had over the last, last decade or so. We need to change that. And we need to believe that it's our right to have top quality health care that we, means that we can live well and achieve our potential. We also believe that one of the challenges that we face as a community is perhaps unique to people living with bipolar. It is a fluctuating condition. It has truly extraordinary people who have done great things. And you're gonna hear from so many of them today. But when people come, become unwell, they're not able to do the things that they want to do. And that's why of our Bipolar Commission, what we want to do as a charity is to provide a call to our community to ensure that when one of you becomes unwell, that there's another two of you to be able to step up that can support the person, but also to be able to advocate for the changes. We want to work with you while you're well and to be able to continue that when you're unwell. And we know by working together that it is possible that every single person in the UK can live well with bipolar and can achieve their potential. And we can take the number of people with bipolar who are completing suicide because of the condition down to zero. We know we can do that. We're going to put a plan in place and we're going to do it together. One of the things that we would like you to actions we'd like you to take today to make that possible is over the next couple of days, you'll get a survey from us asking about your experience of diagnosis and also about what triggered your bipolar in the first place. If you're living with bipolar and you've got a diagnosis, we would love you to complete the survey and to share your story of your bipolar so that we can share it with other people. We think that would be a really powerful tool to be able to get us started with our bipolar commission. So please do take the survey. We would also love to be able to run this conference again next year. Caroline's family has given us a wonderful opportunity to come together for the first time. And I would love to be able to use today as a springboard to us agreeing and committing to running the conference again next year. That means us raising £20,000 to be able to run the conference. That sounds like a huge amount of money, but for everyone on this call right now, it might mean everyone just spending 10 or £20 making a small donation to the charity, which would allow us to make that commitment to you over the next couple of days. 
To make it as easy as possible to donate, we've got a text donate function. You can donate through the website. And also just to give you an added, added incentive, a really amazing donor has committed to match funding the first 5,000 pounds worth of donations. So if you're thinking of making a donation now, please do. And then we'll be able to get that, that, that donation match funded. So for every pound you give, we get an extra pound on top of that. So please do complete our survey. Enjoy the rest of today. And if you hear something that you think someone else would benefit from, please do donate so that we can run this conference again next year. It's now with great honor and a great pleasure that I'm going to hand you over to the amazing Dr. Claire Dolman. Claire, over to you. Hi there. The tragic story of Caroline's suicide very much resonated with me. I too was diagnosed with bipolar in my early 20s and I also made a suicide attempt and got into all sorts of trouble before my family staged an intervention and I was carried off to hospital at the age of 23. I think a major difference is that I was put on lithium and it worked so well for me leveling out my moods and allowing me to train and work as a journalist, get married and live a reasonably stable and productive life. Again, like Caroline, we both had two children and suffered relapses when they were born. I suffered a postpartum psychosis after the birth of my first child. Research now tells us that if you have bipolar, you have a 50% chance of childbirth triggering an episode and it might have been possible to avoid that episode that landed me in hospital for several weeks if I'd had really good preconception and pregnancy advice back then. That advice is now available to all women in England, partly because over the last decade, people with lived experience have joined psychiatrists and other professionals in the Maternal Mental Health Alliance to campaign vehemently to improve services. And I want to see a similar crusade on behalf of all people with bipolar disorder. For too long, bipolar has been overlooked by the health service and research funders, despite the fact that it affects more people than schizophrenia and has a higher suicide rate than depression. In this country, there's no clear lifetime programme of care specifically for people with bipolar. Instead, most mental health trusts provide generic care that has no continuity, with people with bipolar sometimes picked up by a crisis resolution team or a psychosis team or a complex care team. It always seems to take a crisis before we get any help. The minute we're well enough to be signed off that expensive secondary care, we're most often left with no support except the local GP, who's usually had minimal education on bipolar disorder. If we're depressed enough to seek help to stop our low mood from plummeting dangerously, we're denied treatment with IAPT, the so-called increased access to psychological therapy, that's increased access for many people struggling with their mental health, but not if you have bipolar disorder. They won't see us because we're too difficult for them to deal with. Long gone are the days when we were able to regularly see a psychiatrist with whom we could develop a relationship and who could recognise our individual mood swings. So is it any wonder that bipolar disorder still has the highest percentage of lives lost to suicide of any mental illness? When I became chair of the board of Bipolar UK 11 years ago, sadly, one of my first duties was to represent the charity at the funeral of the woman who'd been chair three years before me. She had committed suicide in her 50s. And she's just one of many people that I've met through the course of uh, having the condition and meeting people through the charity that unfortunately that's been their end. So you can see why this is so close to my heart. We have to stop these tragically premature deaths from happening. Deaths that leave children, families and friends bereft and forever affected. 
And the best way to achieve that is to improve the services and lifelong support for all people with bipolar disorder and those who care for them. My contact with Bipolar UK, and in particular, the appalling lack of research on how bipolar affects women, inspired me to study for a PhD at King's College on women with bipolar and pregnancy. And this work's led to many invitations to present to psychiatrists to make sure that they give women the information about pregnancy and childbirth that they need. But there are so many areas of bipolar disorder care that are neglected. And we need to combine forces to get something done about it. This Bipolar Commission is our opportunity. Please take part and tell your friends. Fill in the diagnosis survey, as Simon says, and the others that will be coming out over the year. Tell us your thoughts and what needs to be done and your ideas on the best way to improve things. Send us any evidence that you have and join our e-community to continue the conversation. At Bipolar UK, we're trying our hardest to raise awareness and get funders interested. But as you know, we're a very small charity, despite being the only national charity dedicated to bipolar. So I'm delighted to be co-chairing the Bipolar Commission launch today. This is our chance to shine a light on bipolar disorder and demand the research and improved services that we deserve. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you so much for that um, really good, eloquent explanation as to why the commission is so important. And it's it's really amazing to have you on board. And thank you so much for everything you've done for our community over the years as well. Um, it's now a great pleasure to introduce Professor Guy Goodwin, who's been, uh, well, is one of the leading world academics on, on bipolar and also um, within psychiatry as well. And um, is, is knows uh, thousands of people with bipolar and has been such a wonderful advocate for all of their services. So Guy, it's really lovely to have you now um, as our co-chair of our, of our commission. Would you like to say a few words as well, please? Yes, thank you very much, Simon. It's a great honor and opportunity for me to co-chair the Bipolar Commission with Claire. Um, its work, of course, is ahead of us. I don't want to anticipate too much about it, but we already know what some of the key issues are and what has to change. And my conviction about this stems from my own personal experience of managing patients with bipolar disorders, both in outpatient and inpatient settings over the last 40 years. So here are, the, here are the issues. The first is the low priority of bipolar disorder and its particular characteristics for Department of Health planning. This dates, unfortunately, from the National Service Framework in 1999. So it's 20 years of neglect. Why this occurred is interesting. I think it is because um, the centrality of poor social outcomes for psychotic disorders really dominated the interests and the mentalities of the people who put together the plan in the first place. And it means that they discounted the medical needs of bipolar patients. And they have really not figured, as you heard rather shockingly from Simon, in any of the major initiatives that have taken place in the last 20, 20 years or more. Secondly, I think uh, the poor understanding of its importance, which in a sense is exemplified by the Department of Health's own policies, um, is also an issue as a cause of suicide. We've heard about the data from Simon, we've heard about the reality of what it really means from Caroline's family. As a cause of as death, suicide is always exceedingly painful for the people left behind. And it's always regarded as a most important indicator of the health of, of uh, psychiatric services. But the specific association with bipolar disorder is almost always lost. And it's all too often referred to as a mystery why people kill themselves. Unfortunately, it's often not a mystery. It's because they have bipolar disorder. The other issue relating to premature death is physical illness. Unfortunately, bipolar patients suffer from poor treatment of their physical problems as well as their psychiatric problems. And that makes it all the more tragic that we have here a condition that is more treatable in some ways than other severe forms of severe mental illness. So the, the ignorance about its, its risks, the ignorance about its importance in the relation to physical health care 
and the absence of effective treatment models are all huge issues that we've got to address. So this really comes, us to, comes to the third issue, and that's the need for better and more specialist services to fill the yawning gap that Claire described between inpatient admission on the one hand and GP care on the other. This sort of provision has got to be shaped by the needs of patients themselves. It's got to be based on what works, and that means socially, psychologically, medically. It's got to be based on better access to expert, to expert help, and it's got to be shaped by what works for patients themselves. So that means harnessing your talent, your optimism. And always remember, which I hope we will do throughout the time of this commission, that you and your families deserve better than what we have had and what we are having. Let's make the future a better place. Thank you very much. This guy, it's really powerful to get Claire's personal lived experience alongside the, the kind of clinical expertise that you bring and the real kind of passion around improving the evidence base for better for better specialist intervention. So it's really, we're so grateful that both of you are able to, to lead this commission. Um, it's now a great pleasure I get to, to introduce Leah Charles King, who um, was a leading R&B artist back in the 1990s. Uh, I wasn't into R&B music myself personally, but I've seen the catch up clips and it's pretty impressive stuff. Um, Leah is also someone who's living with bipolar and she shared that experience on the on the one show as well. And um, she's also one of our most effective bipolar UK ambassadors. Um, she's um, done lots of clips for us. Uh, you've probably seen her on, on our YouTube channel and also on our on our Facebook. So it's real great pleasure to to introduce Leah Charles King. Leah, do you want to join us? Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Simon. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Yeah, I've got my cup of tea. It's going OK so far, isn't it? Excellent. <laughs> it's amazing to be here and as well um, how, the you know, this event has come together today is brilliant. Long may it rain. I hope we could do it every year. I hope so, too. Now, I'm honoured to be here. I'm honoured to be an ambassador. Um, as I've been speaking about for the last couple of years, I was misdiagnosed for decades, actually. I'm now in my 40s. And almost nine years ago, I was diagnosed correctly with bipolar type one. Um, that wasn't an easy diagnosis uh, to come by, but because of my suicidal ideations and the impulsivity and, and the manic behavior, I knew instinctively it was, my behavior was a, a degree that I'd never touched upon before. I had just felt like I was out of control and, um, my actions were quite drastic because I felt like I was going to do something quite drastic. So I, I wrote a, what was a, a suicide note to my GP and, and that changed everything. That was the day where it was, it felt like my last ditch attempt and it really was. Um, and I was relieved at first when I was referred and eventually got the correct diagnosis, but then it, it turned into shame. I felt embarrassed. I felt afraid I was isolated even more than I'd ever been and um, I just wasn't getting the correct care and I really believe that having bipolar meant that I was now you know on a death sentence and um, so diagnosis is scary but what I want to say is that you know two years ago now I came out and started speaking boldly about my diagnosis because I realized that First of all, it would it it was like the last piece of my recovery that I needed. I I felt like I was wrapped in chains. I was so open in every other way, but yet hiding this part of myself that I just didn't didn't no longer want to hide. And so I started speaking out. And the to be honest, the what people said to me was amazing in terms of the overwhelming support. I realized that it was important to speak about because there's so much stigma and so many things people don't know. Um, like, you know, they, many people said to me, what does bipolar look like? You don't even look bipolar. But yeah, I had no idea. I'd been suffering and highly functioning for many, mm. many years. Um, so here I am, fast forward years down the line, it's still 
a journey. It's still difficult. It's not the easiest thing to live with. However, I feel more empowered since speaking out about it, since connecting um, with other people with Bipolar. And what makes me so happy about being ambassador for Bipolar UK is because before I became an ambassador, that was the only place I could go to, to look at different forums and the e-community to see what other people we're talking about or what they're going through. And I didn't feel mad or alone mm. and all the, the horrible stigmas that go in your head. You really feel like you're on this really lone journey. So I just want to thank you Bipolar UK and the other ambassadors mm. as well, because we've become a little family and support each other. So thank you for the work that you're doing, Simon and everyone else. Thanks Leah. We're really lucky to have you, so thank you. Thank you. Now I'm really, um, excited about this and thank you for asking me because we have sir norman lamb with us right we certainly do yeah i think he's gonna he's gonna jump on and i'm gonna jump off now so um okay. hi hi sir norman it's lovely to see you watcher very good to see you both hi Hello, sir Leah. norman lamb now i've got an intro for you so i've got to do it okay sir norman lamb chair of south london and Maudley trust it's fantastic to have you now you are a long-standing and active campaigner for mental health and uh, you have worked to challenge stigma around mental health and to ensure people with mental health issues are treated with the same priority as patients with physical health needs thank you for being here pleasure and very good now, to see you. I'm glad we can hear you too. Uh, now, the first question, what motivates you to improve mental health services the way you do? So for 18 and a half years, I was Member of Parliament for North Norfolk. Uh, and I also had a period as Minister responsible for mental health during the coalition government. But I uh, became very interested in health issues as an MP. Uh, I came across so many cases where people uh, didn't experience uh, equal access for those who uh, experienced mental ill health. Uh, and so uh, I saw that there was an important cause to be fought for what I would call equality for mental health as against physical health. And then we had our own sort of family experience of uh, mental health. Our oldest son, Archie, uh, when he was 15, was diagnosed with obsessive uh, compulsive disorder, uh, which is a punishing condition for those who know about it in its true form. Uh, and, it, you know, for a teenager going through that, it can be really painful. I remember the moment when he said to me, Dad, why am I the only person who's going mad? Uh, and, you know, it was that awful uh, sense of, uh, being frightened by what was happening in his head. Um, uh, but here's the thing, you know, when we uh, needed the NHS, we had to wait six months for uh, treatment uh, and we couldn't wait that long. We were desperate. So we paid for treatment. But here's the thing, you know, most people can't pay uh, and there is no justice in that. So, you know, it made me very driven to fight for access to mental health services and to support uh, uh, and you know to fight the cause of equality uh, uh, equal treatment for everyone and then i should also say uh, in 2015 my older sister catherine um, took her own life uh, in her mid-60s after a period of intense clinical depression uh, following the death of our mother uh, and so our family has gone through the the pain of suicide like so many other families across our country. I'm sorry for the loss of your sister, Norman, and um, you know, to hear the struggles that you've gone through with your son as well. And that always seems to be the case a lot that the, the likes of just the average person like me or you getting these services really quickly is not very easy at all. And that prolongs yeah. the whole process. And I guess it's not until you're in that situation exactly. and you need those services that you realise there is no real system, is there, really? The, the only, in a way, good thing, Leah, was that having MP after your name made sod all difference. Uh, we were treated appallingly like everyone else. We just were left waiting. Uh, and, you know, that's... Uh, we, we, I suppose... I mean, we went through years of emotional turmoil 
it's it's fair to say that he's in a much better place now. He's 33 and got to a much better place and is able to manage his condition more effectively. But uh, we witnessed what families go through. And so whenever families came to me as a member of parliament, you know, I knew what they were going through. Uh, and so I suppose it gave me a degree of empathy as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, what were you most proud of in your time as minister? You just mentioned it there briefly. Um, you were responsible for mental health from 2012 to 2015. Yeah, so I suppose uh, I regarded myself as a sort of champion of mental health in government. And, and I, I wanted to use the opportunity to advance the cause of mental health whilst I had the chance and I didn't want to just sort of defend the status quo. So, you know, I didn't want to be a, you know, a representative of government trying to defend everything. If I saw stuff that was not acceptable, I would try to call it out uh, and demand improvement. So I remember when Mind did a survey on the use of restraint in inpatient services, uh, which was shocking, you know, uh, endemic use of restraint, including face down restraint, uh, you will be familiar with the awful case of Shaney Lewis uh, in South East London, uh, a, a young black man who lost his life following the use of prone restraint by police in an inpatient setting. So I issued new guidance on uh, the use of restraint, which was aimed at radically reducing the use of restraint. Uh, now, some progress has been made, but in my view, not nearly enough. Uh, we know how we can avoid it and yet we don't apply the evidence uh, effectively enough. I introduced the first ever maximum waiting time standards uh, in mental health, particularly for early intervention in psychosis. Uh, that was in 2014. That was supposed to be the, the start of a whole process to ensure that everybody who experienced mental ill health had the right to access treatment on a timely basis. Frustratingly, once I'd left the department, that whole drive to introduce maximum waiting time standards uh, fell away uh, and they didn't continue the programme. Uh, we also introduced something called Future in Mind, which was a blueprint for uh, the future of children's mental health services, because uh, I think CAMS services uh, are too often dysfunctional families left waiting for ages often very high thresholds, so you can't even get on a waiting list. Uh, and we need to shift towards a, a greater focus on how we prevent mental ill health and how we intervene early to stop a deterioration. So the thing is, it sounds to me there that you have made a lot of change. And unfortunately, as you've moved on into different departments, some of those changes that you made, which were for the benefit of many and um, weren't followed through or continued. Is that not frustrating to you? Oh, it's, imme it's immensely frustrating. It was so difficult after 2015 to leave the department. You know, I, I was a Lib Dem, so we were almost destroyed and uh, we were out of government. I w went back to the back benches again and I found myself just sort of shouting from the sidelines, uh, really unable to influence what was happening in government. And in a way, that's what uh, led me to decide in 2019 to stand down. Um, and I then took up the role as chair of the South London and Maudsley. And I mean, it's a big undertaking, but there is the opportunity as chair of an organisation to working with others to try to affect change on the ground. Uh, you know, we've established a uh, uh, well, we are establishing a new vision for the organisation, which is all about greater focus on prevention, a respect for human rights, uh, a, a focus on supporting people in the community, avoiding the need for impatient admissions, critically confronting the race issue in mental health, because we know that young black men in particular get detained under the Mental Health Act far more often than young white men. And that raises very disturbing questions about the mental health system. Exactly. And, and that's, I was actually going to come on to that as my next question. How do you think uh, the reform to the Mental Health Act will reduce the rate of sectioning in young black men? Because 
the data is astounding. We've known it for so long, and yet it, it seems to, you know, the beast isn't being tamed, is it? Yeah. No. So, I mean, I think the reforms, the proposed reforms to the Mental Health Act move things in the right direction, but I don't think they in themselves will have any dramatic impact on the rate at which young black men get detained. It will help, it will set a better framework. I would have preferred it to go further uh, in terms of respecting human rights, but uh, I think it's incumbent upon all of us who are involved in the delivery of mental health services to ourselves take responsibility for confronting the uh, disproportionate use of restrictive practices, including detention, taking away someone's liberty, uh, particularly on young black men. And, you know, no change will happen unless we take responsibility uh, and work with communities and with people who use services to change things. Now, our new vision that we've set for the organisation will confront that uh, front and centre, we will say that we must be an anti-racist organisation uh, and that we have a special responsibility to combat it. But then words, fine words are great, but they're no good unless they're followed by action. And that's what we have to be measured by. Exactly. So since becoming chair of SLAM, as, as it's called for sure, I mean, what surprised you most about the running of a mental health trust? I would imagine it's very different to Parliament. It's, it's very different to Parliament. And in a way, you know, I'm outside my comfort zone. I, I got used to being a member of Parliament. I've done it for 18 years. Uh, now I'm doing something to, completely different. And I'm having to, you know, walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And I suppose what I would say is I find... Uh, amazing people within the organization. I find a group of leaders who put in long hours, uh, who make heroic efforts to improve things for the better, but also being completely honest. I also find an organization that is not yet good enough at actually implementing the things that we commit to. So three years ago, long before I turned up, uh, the organization committed to reducing the use of restraint by 50%, for example. Well, three years on, we haven't had much impact on the use of restraint. Now, that's not acceptable. So no. we, if we commit to something, we've got to deliver it or everybody loses faith in the organization. So that's what we've got to change. Uh, and that requires, you know, discipline, robust processes, um, and absolute focus on the important priorities. Um, and this doesn't come easy, but it is achievable. And we've got a group of leaders who are determined to get there. In the bigger picture, you know, the people who are in charge of changing these policies, like government, obviously, what is it that, you know, what is the disconnect because from a patient's perspective, I just don't understand it. I don't get the long waits. I don't get the fact that my paperwork and my records have been lost a, a ton of times. You know, I, I, I don't accept that it's taken almost 10 years to get therapy or that I was easily misdiagnosed as depressed for many years. Yeah. And by the time I was correctly diagnosed, I was told that I was very close to a psychotic episode because of the medication being given to me by my GP. So yeah. what, why is there this disconnect? Is it a case of it's just trendy to say mental health now, but really when it comes to mental illness, it's still so taboo and still so stigmatised or maybe people just don't care enough, it's swept under the carpet. Like, what is it from your point of view? Well, I think you've put it brilliantly there. Um, I think as a society, we're on a journey. Uh, if you go back 10 years, stigma was far worse you know it was it was a hidden set of conditions that people simply didn't talk about i was really struck by what you said about when you came out and talked about it for the first time after your diagnosis you know it's almost like it's liberating um 
for our son, he was uh, very frightened uh, about the impact on his career if he was to speak openly about it. Yeah, but me. then for various reasons, he was, because of press interest in him, because he was the son of a minister, I'm afraid, he was forced almost to come out and talk about it. But he actually found it a liberating experience. It was a cathartic moment mm. because he no longer had to play an act. He no longer had to pretend yes. that there weren't issues he had to deal with. And I think that was like an enormous weight being lifted off his shoulders. And actually people praised him for speaking out. He works in the music business like you uh, have done. And, you know, he was, uh, he found that people in the music business uh, praised him for talking out about his mental ill health. And of course, amongst people in the music business, it's very prevalent. You know, you have a lot of creative people uh, who often experience issues of their own uh, and having people who are empathetic and who understand mm. actually is a very good thing uh, and something to be proud of not to hide now we've literally got a couple of minutes and so let's see if we can squeeze in a couple more questions and um, how difficult has it been to maintain priority for mental health service provision during the pandemic well I think that a lot of people have sort of suffered in silence during the pandemic. What we actually witnessed as a trust in the first lockdown and then in the second lockdown in January was that the number of people presenting to us and in accident and emergency departments went down to start with. Mm. And I think this was people who were frightened to leave home, frightened that if they went to hospital, they may get infected. Uh, and so they were having to cope with their crises in the secrecy of their own home. And, you know, I'm acutely aware that many people went through extraordinary traumas during this pandemic. We've had heroic staff who have kept the show on the road throughout this period, often working with their own fear of being infected and yet being willing to work on the front line, <laughs> supporting vulnerable people. So, and I just want to ask you, sorry, Norman, because I literally have no, no. one minute left with you. One minute and then they're going to cut us off. So I just wanted to get this question in really quickly. In terms of the Bipolar Commission, as you know, we're launching it today. Um, where do you believe the Commission could have most impact and what could the opportunities be? Well, I endorse everything that Guy and Claire said. And I think elevating the whole uh, presence of bipolar and people's understanding and awareness of it within the NHS, let alone amongst the wider public, will be an incredibly important thing. And I think there is a real prize to be had here. You know, I care personally about suicide. You know, that's something that has hit our family. So I think if we can improve services, supporting people to prevent uh, the deterioration of their condition, helping people to self-manage, the psychoeducation that is so important. Routinely doing these things will actually save the NHS money because you reduce the number of admissions that you need to make. So, you know, there's a great prize if we can organise services to support people better, greater links between primary care and specialist services. All of these things can make, I think, a real difference. Sir Norman Lamb, thank you so much and best of luck in your new position as chair at Great South pleasure. Trust. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Leah. And thank you very much, Norman, for that really great um, session there. So uh, in terms of what's going to be happening next, we're about to go for our break. So you've got five minutes to recharge your cup of tea and uh, we're going to be doing a number of breakout sessions. Don't worry if you haven't booked in for any of them so far. It's absolutely fine. You can move between the sessions uh, at your will. Um, most of them will be recorded except for the work and learning ones. So if you do miss any, you'll be able to watch the other ones up on catch up. Um, if you're really interested in the research one, which was the one that we, um, when we did a quick feedback survey, said it was the most popular one, then just stay on this link because we'll be able to, to do the research one here. Um, as we said, there's a code of conduct you should have received. So we will be moderating all the comments. We do know that people get unwell. So if anyone does get unwell and they post stuff that might make other people unwell, 
then we'll, we might have to close down the chat. But we expect that it should be a great open session and we would really want to hear your views of what the speakers are saying. Um, thank you also for all of you who have had uh, been so generous and donated already. I was amazed. We've already had loads of people coming back making donations uh, to help contribute towards the conference next year. So thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, it's going to make it. it should, we're going going a long way now to being able to to organise a conference for for next year as well. We're going to see now some artwork from a, uh, a wonderful artist called Mary Peters who uh, was living with bipolar and used her experience of bipolar to inspire her art. And we should be hearing from Bipolar Beautiful as well, which is an amazing business which donates uh, a lot of their profits to Bipolar UK and tries to create a positive image uh, for people living with bipolar. So I'll let you now go for your break and uh, I hope you'll join us again for the next session. Thank you.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bipolar UK Virtual Conference. Um, my name is Emma Bell, and I live with bipolar. I was diagnosed 10 years ago, and I'm going to be joined shortly by Hamish McAllister-Williams, Stuart Watson, and Robert Westhead. And we're going to be discussing... Um, we're going to be discussing the research gap, and we're going to be talking about medication, um, research, and being part of studies. So I think I'm going to be joined shortly by the guys. Um, let me see, are they here? Here we go. Hamish and Stuart are joining me, and Robert, here they are. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Very well, thanks. Good. Good. So um, in this session, I'm going to be handing over to Hamish shortly. And Hamish um, is going to be talking about overview of medications. And then we're also going to be talking with Stuart about barriers to research and research studies, and also Robert as being part of these research trials. So with that, I'm going to let Hamish in, introduce himself. So Hamish, over to you. Okay, cool. Thank you ever so much, Emma. Uh, let me see if I can manage to share my screen properly. Um, and let's see if I can make it go whole screen as well. So hopefully that's uh, okay and everybody can see the slides okay. Um, so as I said, uh, my name is Hamish McAllister-Williams. Um, I'm Professor of Affective Disorders or otherwise known as Mood Disorders um, at Newcastle University. And um, I'm um, lead consultant for the Regional Affective Disorders Service uh, based in Newcastle. And uh, the Regional Affective Disorders Service or RADS is a highly specialized service. It's a tertiary level service where we see patients um, with uh, complex and difficult to treat mood disorders who are referred to as by um, other psychiatrists um, in the, from the north of England, but also from further afield as well. And I'm gonna be talking about um, what the current medications are, or current medication options are before handing over to Stuart, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, research that's ongoing to try and increase our number of medication options. Um, because I'm talking about medications, it's very important that I um, give my disclosure of interest. I've worked uh, over the years, I've worked with a lot of different pharmaceutical companies. Um, I'm not employed by them and I've never been employed by them. And I don't hold any shares with any company and have no ongoing fi uh, financial relationship with any company. But some of these companies have uh, provided fees for me to give talks at meetings or to attend uh, consultancy uh, panels. Um, and all of the money from that actually goes into Newcastle University. So despite all of this work, um, I'm not a, a wealthy man from it. Now, I'm not gonna be promoting any particular drug. I'm only gonna be talking about what the current evidence base is and what the guidelines say. We have two major sets of guidance, guidelines in the UK around medication. We have the obvious one, which is NICE, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. Uh, and they are the big body that gives recommendations around clinical management of, of all conditions across the whole of medicine. The British Association for Psychopharmacology is a much more specific uh, body that, as the, as the word, as the name says, it's a British uh, focused organization and it focuses on medication or psychopharmacology um, for mental health problems. And I'm gonna be focusing on the BAP guidelines, partly because I think they're much better than the NICE guidelines. They're easier to read, they're easier to follow. I think they're more used for clinicians uh, and they're more up to date than the most up to date um, NICE uh, bipolar guidelines. And that's the major reason for focusing on it. But the two sets of guidelines, NICE and BAP, are not inconsistent with one another. So although I'm focusing on this, it's not inconsistent with NICE guidelines. And you can freely see these guidelines. You can download these. Um, if you go to um, bap.org.uk, and there are a whole load of guidelines on that website, and you can download any of the, uh, the guidelines and have a look at them uh, if you so wish. And when we're thinking about managing bipolar disorder, it is a complicated um, condition because what we know is that individuals can have episodes of elevated mood, um, referred to as hypermania or mania. They can have episodes of depression. 
And we also have an issue around keeping people well. So once they've got well, what can we do to actually help them stay well? So there are really three elements uh, to, to the management, uh, or you can think about management in, in, in three different areas, uh, mania, depression, and long-term treatment. And I'm going to go through each of those just very briefly. So let me start with mania or elevated mood. This is what the BAP guideline says. That if people are not on long-term treatment, um, then if they're on an antidepressant, we would usually recommend tapering and discontinuing it. That is because we think antidepressants can make elevated mood worse. They might even precipitate an episode of mania in their own right. And therefore, often we would look to get rid of the antidepressant if somebody has gone high. The higher somebody is, the more likely is we would recommend that. And then in terms of um, alternative medication to actually treat the elevated mood, there is one big group of medications, the antipsychotics, and that's a large group of drugs. There are many, many antipsychotics. Um, these are drugs that are also used for schizophrenia, but also have evidence for being effective in treating mania. We focus mainly on second generation drugs, particularly alanzapine, quetiapine, risperidone, and but there are also alternatives to uh, antipsychotics, uh, lithium, valproate, and carbamazepine. These are different drugs. They work in a slightly different way, but all of these drugs can be effective in terms of treating elevated mood. Because one of the major issues that can occur when somebody has elevated mood is problems sleeping, we um, also consider using benzodiazepines like diazepam, temazepam, to help people sleep at night. If somebody is already taking long-term treatment, then it's all around optimizing that as much as we can, adding in an antipsychotic if the person is not already on one, because it, it, the antipsychotics are really our first-line treatments for elevated mood. If somebody's on an antipsychotic but not on lithium valparate or carbamazepine, then again, we might add one of those. And if people, if, if, the, if, the, if the mania does not fully respond to those treatments, our sort of fallback options are using clozapine as the antipsychotic or possibly electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. So that's what's in the current guidelines. So three specific drugs, lithium valparate, carbamazepine, and one group of drugs, um, antipsychotics, which include a number. And all antipsychotics that have been studied have been found to be effective in treating mania, at least for some patients. So what about depression? The issue with depression is we have many, many fewer treatments. So if people are not already on treatment, these are the four drugs that are recommended in the BAP guidelines, only four drugs in total. Three of them are antipsychotics, quetiapine, lorazidone, and olanzapine. And one of them is a different type of drug, lamotrigine. That's a drug that is also used in epilepsy. And these are, um, at the time the guidelines were written, these were the only drugs that had really got strong evidence for effectiveness in treating bipolar depression. Notice it's only three of the antipsychotics, it's not all of them. All of them seem to work in terms of treating mania, but only those three, um, up until what I'm going to say in, in a little bit, some of the, there's a newer option come along. But um, at the time the guidelines were written, those were the only three antipsychotics that had got evidence in bipolar depression. There's a lot of uncertainty about antidepressants and the role of antidepressants in treating bipolar depression. Um, some people do seem to respond, but on average, um, people don't respond to antidepressants. Bipolar depression doesn't tend to respond. But that, as I say, doesn't exclude the possibility that some individuals' depression can. If they are being used, they have to be used very, very carefully because of the risk of the antidepressant causing the person to go high. So they generally should be co-prescribed with a drug that would actually treat mania, one of the drugs that I've already mentioned. If these don't work, what other options do we have? Not a lot up, uh, up until more recently. One is going for ECT again, and the other is the possibility of lithium if the depression is less severe. And it's particularly thinking about if somebody is not already on lithium, the lithium may be helpful moving into the longer term. If somebody gets on well while on long-term treatment, well, again, it's sort of just really optimizing whatever they're already on and addressing any stressors that might have led to that depression, if at all possible, and if these can be identified. 
So many, uh, many fewer options for bipolar depression. That is the big area of unmet need um, with regard to treatment in bipolar generally, not just with regard to medical. And then we've got a third uh, element in terms of treatment, which is long-term treatment. We've got a number of options, but again, not a lot. So in the BAP guidelines, there are uh, five medications that are particularly highlighted. These are the ones that are in red. And we've got lithium, cotarpin, alantapine, and lamotrigine. So that's three of the ones used in bipolar depression plus lithium. And then we've got valparate. The data for valparate is slightly different to the data supporting the first four. And what BAP suggests is that lithium should be our first line choice. Just a digression about lithium. Some of you may be aware of the fact that there had been a problem with lithium, particularly Priadel, the most commonly used form of lithium, uh, last year. And it was reported that Priadel was going to stop being made. That is now um, not an issue, and Priadel will continue to be uh, manufactured. I've got a couple of treatments that have got slightly less strong evidence than these. Uh, five, aripiprazole and carbamazepine, um, but the evidence for them is slightly less. In terms of how these work, there is a bit of difference between them. So lithium, quetiapine, and probably valparate prevent um, uh, depression and mania, at least to some extent. Alanzapine and aripiprazole and carbamazepine are much better at preventing mania and less so depression. Whereas lamotrigine is the opposite picture. It tends to prevent depression and not so much mania. What you see here is a picture that is rather similar to how good they are at actually treating mania and depression acutely. Lithium and antipsychotics are good at treating mania acutely. And these four have got evidence for preventing mania. Lamotrigine works in terms of treating depression, but also preventing it. A couple of important points. We know that lithium can also reduce risks of suicide, and that's one of the reasons why it is the BAP recommended first line option. Valparate is a major risk in women of childbearing potential, and generally it should not be used unless absolutely everything has been tried and ruled out and the woman is on very substantial, significant, and effective contraception. So is that it? Is that it? That, is that all the drugs that we have available? Well, that is a concern, but we do have some new directions. First one to mention is a new antipsychotic called Cariprazine. This has been licensed in the UK for schizophrenia, but there is also some data in bipolar depression. This is one of three studies suggesting that cariprazine is more effective in reducing depression compared to the orange line there, which is placebo. So this is a new option, and it is a welcome option because um, unlike medications like quetiapine or olanzapine, cariprazine causes much less weight gain. So it does have that advantage. It's more similar to aripiprazole, but aripiprazole doesn't have such good data in bipolar depression. Aripiprazole works uh, pretty well in bipolar mania, but less clearly in bipolar depression, whereas cariprazine seems to work better in bipolar depression, but be similar to aripiprazole in terms of causing less weight gain, less metabolic problems. So that's a new antipsychotic. Um, I doubt many people will be familiar with that because it is a relatively uh, new option. Here's another new drug option, or one that has at least been shown to be effective in bipolar depression quite a long time ago, but isn't a simple, straightforward medication to use. But its significance is that it is completely different pharmacologically and how it works to all of the treatments that I've mentioned. And this is ketamine, the anesthetic ketamine. This is looking at the effects of a single dose of it given intravenously into a vein in the arm. And what you see here is significant improvement in depression 40 minutes, 40 minutes after the infusion. It works incredibly rapidly. So this data is then going out to sort of day seven, day three is here. This is day three, day seven. 
What you can see is by day three and certainly by day seven, the benefit of the single dose has worn off. So this is something that seems to work short, short term, but it does require um, an intravenous injection. So that is obviously um, a, a bit of a downside of it. Something which has now recently been licensed for use in depression, unipolar depression, not bipolar depression, is esketamine. This is the sort of is um, sort of believed to be the active ingredient of ketamine. And the advantage of this preparation is that it can be given by intranasal spray. You spray it up your nose and it can lead to an improvement in mood. Now, there aren't studies of this yet in bipolar disorder. But if intravenous esketamine, intravenous ketamine works, then one might imagine esketamine might. So this is something that we need to explore further, that this might offer as an additional option that is much easier than giving people um, an injection of a, of a drug that's used as an anesthetic. And then finally, really just one other thing, just to say that there is a whole area of research into treatments that would be referred to as neurostimulatory treatments. These are things that um, alter brain activity via electrical or magnetic uh, um, stimulus. Um, ECT would be the old fashioned version of, the, of, of a, a neuromodulatory treatment, but we're getting newer ones. This one is about VNS, vagus nerve stimulation. This involves the implantation of a pacemaker like device um, underneath the skin and the chest wall with a wire up to uh, the vagus nerve in the neck. And this stimulation plus treatment as usual is better than treatment as usual in terms of helping people get well. And it's a very long lasting treatment. This is showing benefit over five years. And there is data that demonstrates that it works both in bipolar and in unipolar disorder. It's something that is being explored more by a very large study currently ongoing in the United States. And finally, I just wanted to say very quickly about putting all of these medications into context. It is all about regularly reviewing an individual's uh, diagnosis and treatment, thinking about whether there are any medications that could be withdrawn, any that could be optimized, any new ones that could be considered, and considering all management options, medication, psychotherapies, neurostimulatory treatments that I've just mentioned, psychosocial treatments such as talking therapies, et cetera, and whether referral to a highly specialized service might be warranted to consider some of the more specialized treatment, for example, the vagus nerve stimulation that I showed. So I'm going to leave um, it there and then hand over to Stuart. Everybody. Um, and, and, and can I just say, first of all, what a tremendous honor it is uh, to be here at a Bipolar UK conference. And, and also just how sort of exciting it is um, to um, follow Leah Charles King, who just makes me feel now so sort of dull and drab. Um, that was uh, tremendous. And Nor Norman Lamb as well, who's, who's, who's such an advocate for change and such a, a champion of change in mental health. So that, that adds to the honour. But, but Bipolar UK, fantastic organisation. Um, pleased to be here. Um, and I'm presuming that you can see my, my slides. So I... Um, um, work with Hamish. In fact, I can see he's in his office, so he's just two doors down from me um, at, at the moment. And I and I work like like Hamish with um, for um, uh, in the NHS. I work um, in a mental health trust in the northeast of England. Um, I work on an, an, an inpatient unit, um, and I um, also um, work on the ECT suite. Um, and I work at Newcastle University. I'm a clinical um, senior lecturer. And one of the things that I do here is bipolar research, um, so it's it's, um, it's good to have a chance to talk talk about that. Um, these two organisations, um, our trust and the university, are two major contributors to NCMD, the Northern Centre for Mood Disorders, um, and uh, you can see our logo at the bottom of the slides. These slides are going to be available um, if anybody wants them afterwards, um, I think it's fair to say. Um, and you can contact me. The, my email address is there. Our website address, the NCMD website is, address is there, www.mooddisorders.co.uk. Um, there's also below that the details of our research register. So this is um, um, if you um, go on the list, if you um, we have uh, one of our colleagues, Samantha Bulmer, runs this. And if you give her 
your details. She'll keep you um, updated of, um, of things that are, are, are happening here. Um, and we're new to Twitter, but we've got a we've got a, a an NCMD uh, Twitter handle, um, and we're trying to um, put things out on that. So if, uh, do feel free to to follow NCMD or follow me. Uh, equally new to Twitter, you join my twenty two other followers, um, and um, and we'll um, try and connect um, that way. Um, research in bipolar disorder is clearly really important and you'll see three columns here first point i want to make is 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 the burden of bipolar disorder obviously this audience don't need to hear that know that already um, but because of the large number of people who have bipolar disorder because of the impact that it has it makes it a significant contributor um, to disability worldwide yet despite that Funding isn't sufficient for research. Only 4% of research grants are for mental health studies. Um, and of these, very few are for bipolar. Now, I'm going to show some slides, some pictures, just to, inf um, uh, just to illustrate that. And I'll come back to this slide in a moment. So these are all, uh, in the blue is um, uh, medical research grants that aren't for mental health, and green is mental health. It's a tiny proportion of medical research grants come to mental health despite the size of that burden. Um, uh, and of, of those mental health grants, very few of them are for bipolar disorder. So you can see here the commonest, the um, most grants, uh, that's blue, most money, that's uh, salmon, pink are we going for, Emma? Yeah, okay, uh, are for... Um, uh, non-disease specific, but substance abuse, depression, autism spectrum, psychosis, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, other neurodevelopmental disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, uh, ADHD, all um, attract more grants, more research. Um, and, and that's something that we need to work very hard to change. I saw a guy... Um, say that uh, 20 years ago, I saw him say 20 years ago that bipolar disorder was a Cinderella uh, specialty and, and that hasn't changed, that remains the same. Um, and of the studies, there's some that are going to uh, the top couple of lines, some go into basic research. Um, but if we look at, um, at the research into whether or not treatments are actually working, um, it's a tiny portion of the tiny proportion of of uh, mental health studies that are bipolar, which is a tiny proportion um, of the studies that go to mental health. Um, so we do need to change things. Um, and um, uh, Simon Kitchen's hopefully um, on his way to uh, to driving some of that change. So uh, back to this slide, uh, burden of, of, uh, of bipolar disorder, there's not enough money for research. What this means is that we don't have uh, the basic science studies to determine the biological cause of the treatment targets. We don't know enough about bipolar disorder yet. Um, we don't have money for pilot studies to run small studies to test the way for larger studies. We don't have enough qualitative studies. We don't spend enough time talking to patients and carers um, to get their views to understand about patients' needs. Um, we don't have the opportunity to develop the re research infrastructure as much as we would like. We don't have the data to inform larger studies and it all makes it much harder to get research council funded treatment studies. Bipolar research is important. There's lots of people working very hard to change it to get more research, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Now, the other burden is, is, is recruitment. It's very difficult for research teams to attract people into uh, research studies. Now, it's really important that we can do this. It's important for commercial res research. So if you think about drug companies, global research, we want them to be doing their research here in the UK. We want to know whether new treatments work in the NHS, in NHS settings. Um, and unless we can um, make those commercial studies work, this won't happen. We'll find out whether whether drugs work in America and elsewhere. Uh, recruitment into studies is also essential for government-funded studies, for the kind of studies that I'm going to be talking about in a little while. 
um, because we just need to understand more. We need to understand um, what works and what doesn't work and and uh, and get the treatments um, that, are, that are going to make a difference. And there's lots of reasons why it's difficult um, to, um, for, to link um, people with studies. And, and there's a, I think there's something of a disconnect between the people trying to do the research and the people with bipolar disorder. I think that um that that i think there's, we can talk about that some more and there's all kinds of reasons why why that's difficult and we need to try and break some of those barriers down um and uh, and get more people more patients involved in studies um, and make that routine part of practice so that we can really get an understanding of, of what works i was watching some of the chat earlier and everybody talking about the different medications that they're taking um and 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 there's a huge potential for capturing information about who's doing well with what drugs that we that we're not capturing so we need to do all of more of this and we need to do it better um and being in a trial is um is therapeutic so this is this is data from one of our studies um, um and and with here we were looking at a drug called mifepristone which works on the stress hormone axis and what you'll see with this graph is that the blue line the mifepristone line that 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 throughout the study, um, patients in the trial, these were patients who had bipolar depression, and lots of them have been depressed for a long time, did better. They got better with the drug that we were testing. Um, and we were only testing it for a brief period. That's in the gray shaded area. That's a week period. People got better. But they also got better before starting the drug, and they got better um, if they weren't randomized to the drug, if they were randomized to placebo. Um, so we could conclude from this that the drug didn't help. We was a we tried it, it didn't work, we move on. But the reason that I'm showing it is because it just shows how well everybody in the study did. Coming into the study is therapeutic. Why? All kinds of reasons. I think that, you know, the additional level of support from the research team, all manner of things, but it makes a big difference. So, um, you, you, you know, um, I, I suppose the point I'm making is don't be frightened of, of, of research. It, you know, it can be a very good thing. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of example studies um, to show the kind of work that's ongoing. So I've got uh, two studies that I want to talk about, one that's current, one that's planned. Uh, the current study um, is PAX-BD. Now, this is Hamish's study. So Hamish, um, because Williams, who you just heard, is the chief investigator for the study based here in Newcastle. The study runs um, across the UK. It's... Um, a randomized double blind, uh, so um, uh, the researchers don't know who's on what drug, placebo controlled, um, so um, half the population, half the patients are prescribed placebo and half the active drug, which is pramipexol, taken alongside mood stabilizers for patients with treatment resistant bipolar depression. There's the website address um, if anyone wants to have a look and the page on the MCM MD website as well. Um, it's funded through the National Institute of Health Research um, through a particular aspect of that, the Health Technology Appraisal, which is about funding uh, large-scale research studies. It's sponsored by our trust, the uh, CNTW, the Cumbria Northumberland Tanway NHS Trust. Um, uh, with Hamish is the chief investigator, principal investigators um, who are um, people who are in, very important in bipolar research in the UK, Danny Smith in Glasgow, uh, Richard Morris in Nottingham, John Geddes at Oxford, um, Alan Young and Paul Stokes um, down in London. And um, and it's happening in a number of places across the country, uh, 24 different sites. Um, you can see a star in all of those places um, where research is, where the study is, um, is, is up and running or planned. Um, and um, so... Um, not a bad spread of the country, not complete, but not bad. Um, and uh, so the, the, the drug that, we, uh, that we're looking at, that Hamish is looking at, is Pramipexol. So Pramipexol is um, a drug that uh, increases flow of dopamine in the brain. You'll have heard a lot about serotonin and other neurotransmitters in depression. Um, but Pramipexol is a drug that acts on uh, dopamine. It um, is a drug that's used in Parkinson's. And, and, and as it is with mental health, this is what happened. We noticed 
that um, oh, people noticed that, that um, the depression in people with Parkinson's was getting better. That led to some small trials um, in bipolar depression and unipolar depression um, showing that there was benefit. And that's the slide that you can see. The, the green line is primary pixel. People were less depressed taking that than they were taking placebo. Um, and so um, the National Institute of Health Research um, Commission, they asked researchers to put their hands up if they wanted to study PAX-BD, uh, to study primapexol um, in bipolar depression um, and, um, uh, and hence uh, this study. Um, well, uh, just a little point about depression, why that was, why that might be important. Um, and if you think about depression, you can divide the symptoms of depression into those symptoms that people have too much of. Fear, anxiety, irritability, loneliness, guilt, disgust, hostility and pessimism. And those symptoms that people don't have enough of. Pleasure, joy, interest, motivation, energy, enthusiasm, alertness, self-confidence. And it's this second group, these, these pleasure, joy, interest uh, symptoms that dopamine seems particularly important for. And I think it's driving reward systems. And you can see that you need your reward systems activated uh, to feel energetic and enthusiastic and alert. Um, um, and so that is part of the reason why we're thinking about depression, uh, dopamine as important in the treatment of depression. And it does look like dopamine is particularly helpful for these kind of symptoms. So, PAX-BD study is for people with treatment-resistant bipolar depression. Um, and um, um, so that's uh, people who've, uh, for whom the existing treatments um, that Hamish talked about are not appropriate. Um, and um, uh, anyone coming into the study is randomised either to Pramipexol um, or to placebo, it's a year long study. The drugs, the primary pixel is taken alongside mood stabilizing uh, medication to ensure that no one's going to take it and go through into mania. Um, and we just got agreement that people can continue in the study on their antipsychotics. We're looking at 290 participants, which is enough to tell us whether or not this drug does what we want it to do, which is to make uh, bipolar depression better. The main outcomes after 12 weeks, but the whole study lasts for a year. Um, and we've just got it up and running. Uh, we sorry, sorry, we got it up and running um, um, before COVID. So we got one person started and they're now through the year. And we're back up and running now. Um, and the sites are through the country are, are turning their lights green as they, as they are starting. Um, and, um, and we start to get more people coming into the study. So hopefully we'll be able to um, maybe Simon will ask us back another time in a year or two, and we can we can say whether or not uh, the drug has indeed done what we wanted. Um, so um, and it's for it's the idea of the study is that it it matches um, the the population of of patients who are seen in clinic. So it's for anyone aged over eighteen who's got bipolar one or bipolar two who's currently depressed. And we've got a way of measuring depression severity using a scale called the um, QUIDS SR. Uh, SR standing for um, a Quick Inventory of Depression Symptoms Self Referral. Um, and if anyone wants to do their QUIDS SR score, again, it's on our NCMD website and, and you can have a look. And um, we've got a minimum cutoff for the study. Um, and um, we're looking at people for whom quetiapine, olanzapine, lamotrigine, or lorazidone, those drugs that, that Hamish pointed out to you were re recommended for bipolar depression, for, for whom if they're not uh, recommended for or not appropriate, either because of side effects or because they haven't worked, um, then, uh, then that's uh, one of the inclusion criteria for coming into the study. We also need people to be linked to one of our participating sites. Um, and and so that's from a Pexel study, and uh, and as I say, we will we will we will let you know how we how we get on with that. We just started, but if you want more information about that, then we're happy to share and uh, and 
and, and happy to give that out. Uh, I'm sure Hamish will have a little something to say about this um, in, the, in the questions at the end as well. Um, the second study that I want to talk about, I want to give a, a different example. So, so PaxBD is a study that's running. The Ascend is a study that isn't yet running. So this is um, uh, an example of um, the kind of things that we're, we're interested in and that we want to look at. So we've submitted this uh, uh, study, the Ascend study, as a bid to the National Institute of Health Research. Um, and we've been through a process that's lasted um, a year now. Um, and we're waiting with bated breath to see whether the National Institute of Health Research like it and whether they're going to fund it and find out in about oh, in four weeks um, um, whether or not this is, this is funded. I'll go a little bit faster. Um, um, but um, uh, So this is a combination of aripiprazole and sertraline against quetiapine in bipolar depression over 24 weeks, 270 uh, people. Um, and we're doing this in, in 10 UK centres, Newcastle, London, Oxford, Nottingham, Bristol, Somerset, Cornwall, Birmingham, Brighton, Southern, if it's funded. Um, uh, the reason for the study, what Hamish talked about this, these are the drugs that are recommended in bipolar depression. Quetiapine, which is great, which really works, but some people, I'd be interested in your experiences, some people have problems with it, it can cause um, diabetes, it can cause weight gain, it can make people feel sleepy. Lorazidone, which looks good, but it's need the trial. We're on trial evidence that shows it's successful. Not yet get enough uh, evidence in clinical practice. Olanzapine, which particularly with fluoxetine can work well, but again has the burden that quetiapine does of weight gain. And so it's like lamotrigine, um, which is okay. That uh, some people do well with that. Uh, not everybody, um, and we need to be very cautious with it in terms of dose increases. So the bipolar depression studies. Uh, the bipolar depression drugs, we need more of them. Um, um, ba -ba -bum. Stuart, Stuart. Yeah. We, 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 we're well over time. All right, okay. Um, a long way over time. Oh, are so we? We, we? We need to direct to a close, otherwise we're not going to be able to answer all the questions. Okay, all right. So um, I've really rushed through. The, um, so the other, the reason for this, is the boundaries between primary and secondary care, which we can come back to and we can pick up with the questions. Aripiprazole works in unipolar depression alongside an SSRI. We want to see if it works in bipolar depression um, and it's a nicer drug. Uh, it doesn't have the side effect burden of those, uh, of those others. So um, to conclude, bipolar disorder has been actively investigated as a focus in Newcastle, Oxford, Nottingham, London and Glasgow and other centres. There's a real need for work in bipolar disorder particularly to improve treatment options. There's a lack of funding, difficulties in recruitment into studies. These are major challenges for us. PAX BD is an important current studies. Fingers crossed for a send. Thank you very much. Done. Okay, on to me. Over to you, Robert. Okay, so uh, so my name is Robert Westhead. I'm a former chair of Bipolar UK, uh, and I was involved in the, the government's anti-stigma campaign uh, that we were hearing about earlier, uh, and I'm now a sort of NHS communicator by, by profession. Um, now, I am a big fan of these guys we've just heard from, um, these two who are, you know, top, top experts, uh, and there are several reasons uh, why. why. Uh, the primary one is that I think for all of us out there, the 3,000 of us on this call, I suspect most of us want one thing more than anything else. Guess what it is? Effective treatment. We don't want to live with the horrendous uh, symptoms that this devastating illness uh, brings. We want to live normal lives. Uh, and at the moment, treatments, as, as uh, Hamish said, he said there's not <laughs> there's not that much there uh they're partially effective at best none very few people have have you know totally uh excellent outcomes and as other speakers have said about many other issues we deserve so much better and the exciting thing about this is i think we can play a part in this i think people with bipolar disorder and and other people with mental health problems can lobby for change for better mental health treatments 
So this is why I care. I'll just set out four reasons uh, are, are why research is so important. It's uh, the, the, the only road to effective treatment. Uh, I'm going to tell you how I've benefited by being involved in research and, and helping other people in turn. Uh, thirdly, I'm going to tell you how, in sort of parallel, I've a bit about my lifelong struggle to get effective treatment, which has been informed by heavily informed by research. And finally, what can we do to bring about the development of these new treatments more quickly? We've heard much, we've all heard already from Stuart about the, the lack of money, the lack of funding. I was going to talk about that too. So, so why is research so important? Well, it is as simple as that. It's the, it's the road to treatment. We look at cancer. We look at cancer research, uh, where we've seen decades of, of expenditure on, on cancer to beat this horrible killer disease. And they've done it. We're, we're at the point where there are effective treatments for, for, for cancer, cures even for, for cancer. Uh, but this has been the result of decades of millions and millions of pounds of investment from government and donations from the public. Psychiatry, meanwhile, and neuroscience are new sciences at the beginning of their development. Uh, only, we're only beginning to understand a, 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 a tiny bit the, the brain. So we're stuck with lithium. How long has lithium been around? 70 years. <laughs> One, I take lithium and another drug called phenylzine, uh, uh, an out-of-fashion antidepressant that was invented 50 years ago. Um, you know, <laughs> it wasn't that long ago that straitjackets were, were, you know, a bit of a mainstay of, of treatment. Um, so we haven't had many breakthroughs. And this is for us for simple reasons. We haven't had the research, <laughs> and we don't have the research because we don't have funding for the research because it's not been a priority for anyone. So why, why should you take part in trials? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, we've heard a, a bit about some of the benefits, you know, from just taking part in trials. You learn about stuff. You find out what, what the, the latest thinking is that could, you know, lead you to other treatments. You could try, be trialed a treatment that works for you. Uh, but most Sort of importantly, I feel we are helping our community. We're helping other people with bipolar disorder, and we're helping a global community of people who are suffering from from this illness. Uh, so it's vitally important that we do that. So taking part in, in trials is something I, you know I, I think everyone should do if they can. Um, so I said I'd tell you about my very quickly about my sort of lifelong struggle for effective treatment. So I have been fighting tooth and nail for treatments uh, since I was diagnosed at the age of 19, and I've tried pretty much everything under the sun. Some weird things like thyroxine. I, I mentioned phenylzine, this MAOI, which you'll, you'll have a real struggle to get any psychiatrist to prescribe you. All sorts of anticonvulsants. Pregoblin, one you might not have heard of. Tried lorazidone, the antipsychotic. Um, but I had a bit of a, a breakthrough myself. And, and this is after 27 years of seeking treatment for bipolar disorder because I, I have rapid cycling uh, bipolar disorder. So my moods go up for 10 days, down for 10 days. And it's pretty, pretty grim. Uh, and I've had that all my life. Uh, and it, it's been really difficult. And uh, very sadly, uh, two years ago, I ended up in intensive care after a suicide attempt. And not the first time we've heard about that today. Uh, and, and sadly, it seems that it, it often requires a suicide attempt. Uh, forgive me, Stuart and Hamish, to 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 prompt some of our more uh, dilatory uh, psychiatrist friends into actually doing anything. And that's what will happen with me. So I got a referral to the the Maudsley and was prescribed this experimental treatment called nimodipine, which is a, a calcium channel blocker, which has been shown in studies around the world of very small numbers of individuals with rapid cycling to be to be effective for some, for some people and my god for me it for the first time has stopped this constant rapid cycling which made work virtually impossible i was going to have to give up work and and, and uh, so it has been life-changing like that it's not a silver bullet i can tell you it's not going to work for everyone out there unless you've got rapid cycling it's it's really not uh it wouldn't be at all relevant and it's ex an experimental treatment look at it look it up in the Morty guidelines if you if you're interested um but that that's been a really 
influential thing in my life. And it makes me think, um, you know, I felt a bit guilty about having this treatment, that there are all these other people out there with bipolar and other illnesses not getting effective treatment. And I really am angry about it, frankly, and I think we deserve better, as, as we've heard. Um, uh, and if I can just quick, I'm hoping I've got time to quickly share some of the my own slides, which go to the money uh, thing again. Um, so let's see if this is going to work. Ooh, uh, this may not work. Oh, yeah. Is it? Mm, yeah, so it's going funny on me. But, um, yeah, so it's a shame because I've got these great slides, which are a bit like um, uh, Stuart's around the money. And it basically shows that for uh, Kent's, it shows spending in different, different um, uh, health conditions. Uh, and we've got up at the top, cancer uh, with 612 million and uh, mental health uh, right down the bottom with some dementia, 124 million. So we're a long way behind. And actually, uh, interestingly, if you then uh, look at the uh, Stuart did about one condition by condition. So bipolar gets about just under 2 million out of that 124 million. You know, so I really think we are badly neglected in, in, an, in an area, mental health, which is very badly neglected. So what what can we do about this? Um, I think, well, as we've heard, patients need to take part in studies, definitely a good thing, uh, but we need investment. We need to turn around this historic underinvestment in mental health. And you might turn around and say, but hold on, I've heard about all this parity of esteem thing and uh, you know, equal investment in mental and physical health services. Yes, lots of money has been poured into these mental health services, which, remember, are not very useful. So we're kind of throwing, <laughs> putting, throwing good money after bad. And there's been no attempt to invest in mental health research. It's hidden. No one cares about it at all, except me. <laughs> and uh, I'm angry about it really angry and i feel that people like me other people with mental health problems bipolar disorder we should stand up for our what, what we deserve here and demand that uh, government do something about this and the public recognize this and invest because without that investment i'm, I'm afraid to say it's going to be a very slow road to getting improved uh, treatments for us. So if you want to campaign about this, email Bipolar UK, info at bipolaruk.org, and uh, we'll, we'll organise a march or something. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Um, thank you, everybody, for your your knowledge and sharing everything. They We have been inundated with questions. And... Um, as much as we would love to be able to answer all of your questions, there are quite a lot of questions that are to do with individual um, personal treatment, which we wouldn't be able to answer in this setting today. But we are going to try and get the questions from the back end and answer those through our social media channels post-conference as well, which obviously will be answered by the panel where it's appropriate and not too individualised to answer and speak to them. But we do have quite a lot of questions and there were quite a few that were similar. So I'm going to share those now with the panel. And um, if we could unmute everyone, then um, the right person, you know, can answer to those. So, um, there was a lot of questions about quetiapin and weight gain. And I know that one of you touched in that in the panel discussions. Um, the three questions that I saw repetitively were, you know, are there alternatives to quetiapin? Um, do, do you gain more weight in line with a higher dose of quetiapin? And what is the best time to take it to not feel like you've been knocked out you know that zombie feeling I took it I used to wake up in the morning and I'd feel like a zombie for a good couple of hours um could any of you speak to those questions um I can, I can mention a couple of quick things um I think that it, it it does seem to be dose related so I think that high doses are associated with more weight gain but you can get significant weight gain even with quite low doses it does vary quite a lot from one individual to another um, so I think that's an issue. Time of day, when you should take it so you don't feel zonked out. Generally speaking, we often would say take it um, in the evening before you go to bed, help you sleep and 
hopefully the levels are low enough in the morning so you're not feeling zonked out like a zombie in the morning. One trick is if you're on slow release preparation, the XL is to take it two or three hours before you go to bed, not when you go to bed. Because I was if you don't take it when you yeah. go to bed, it's such slow release, it's still releasing it in, in the morning. Yeah. So you need to say take that a few hours before. Yeah. Um, so that, that's definitely one trick. Are there other alternatives? It depends what you're trying to treat. You're trying to treat mania. Yes, there's lots of other antipsychotics that can be used. If you're trying to treat bipolar depression, there are many fewer. Olanzapine is as bad at causing weight gain as quetiapine, but lorazidone certainly causes much less, and that is a good alternative if the issue is around weight gain. And carirpazine, this new drug, also produces less weight gain as well. So again, that is another option. But that is one of the major reasons why we need more research in the area. Amazing. A, a couple of things, uh, Emma. Um, Please. W one thing that would encourage people to do is, is, is to take control of the medication and to, to try. So um, if you're taking the medication at 10 p.m. and it causes problems, try it at 8, try it at 6. Um, uh, own your medication and know what works um, for you. Um, Hamish, um, there was um, a question in the chat about why is there more studies in bipolar depression than mania? And it's because uh, lots of the drugs do work in mania. We're very confident that we can get mania better uh, reasonably quickly. It's bipolar depression that we struggle with more. Um, uh, there was a mention in the chat about lorazidone and is that available? Hamish just talked about it. Um, it's a new drug. It's more available in some places than others. It depends a little bit on local practice. But yes, it should be available everywhere. Hamish mentioned cariprazine, less so cariprazine. That's much more specialist drug, um, and uh, you you know you probably need to be getting to one of the bigger main centres to be to be prescribed that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I, I can definitely talk to that slow release. I used to I used to take it later, and when I started taking it about eight a.m., it helped in the morning. You know, so um, yeah, I used to take it at eight p.m. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not 8 a.m. <laughs> I've been asleep all day. Um, so also there was a question in there about ECT being, is that mostly used for mania? No. Oh, well, Stuart, you're the ECT guy. Um, yeah, so we, we mostly use um, ECT for depression um, when the medication hasn't worked. We will use it for mania, so treatment-resistant mania. We use it for treatment-resistant anything, really. Treatment-resistant mania, we do use it but uh, the majority of the patients coming through us have depression. Okay, thank you. And also medication efficiency um, as you age. So this question is coming from an over someone who's over 60. Um, does that need to be taken in con into consideration with your medication as you age? Does that change in any way? Could you speak to that at all? I think sometimes as people get older, they are more prone to getting side effects from medication. Um, but as you get older, you're also more likely to have other problems, other physical health problems. Mm -hmm. um, and you're more likely to be on other medication for those mm -hmm. as well. So there's a whole host of reasons why things get a bit more complicated as you get older. We've got to be much more aware of drug interactions um, mm -hmm. and also the fact that, that, that people can be perhaps a little bit more sensitive to side effects. Um, I think the, the two keys for me as a clinician uh, firstly, you don't treat somebody's age, you treat the person. Yeah. And it depends upon their biological age, not their chronological age. I mean, there's some very young 60-year-olds, there's some very, very old 40-year-olds. Mm. Um, and the other key thing is really just go slow, uh, go low, start, sorry, start low, go slow. So what the, the idea there is that we would start with maybe slightly lower med doses, and then we would just increase the doses maybe slightly slower than we would in a younger person. Doesn't mean to say that we won't end up with the same dose in the end, but we would just go a little bit more cautiously to a particular dose, being aware of the risks that there might be a higher rate of side effects. Great. Yeah. The, the other issue is that is that we're bad at uh, letting people accumulate medication and and starting and adding and adding and adding, and so as people get older, they uh, can be on more drugs. Um, that, that you know, it's it's always important to stop and take stock of that and reduce mm -hmm. what can be used but there is a tendency for drug loads to increase. Mm -hmm. And which medications are best for psychosis and psychotic episodes? Uh, any of the antipsychotics. Mm 
Yeah, and the and there's a question, Emma, about about whether people are more likely to benefit from the antipsychotics if they uh, have a, a tendency to psychosis or if they've been previously psychotic, and and that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so um, you know, the drugs are called antipsychotics because uh, they do have an antipsychotic action, but their action is broader than that. So they have yeah. specific actions for mania and specific actions in bipolar disorder that's not to do with psychosis. Don't let the name that, from you. That, 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 that is a really important point that Stuart makes because the name can be confusing, calling mm -hmm. them antipsychotics. Um, so it's really, as, 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 as Stuart says, they are called antipsychotics. All of them will treat psychosis. Mm -hmm. Some of them, pretty much all of them will treat mania, if not all of them, but only some of them treat bipolar depression. Okay. And the last question before we go, we've got like another 60 seconds. Um, are there genetic links to bipolar? This is like yes. been going on in the chat. People are saying, yes, it is. People are saying, no, yes. it isn't. Yes, definitely. There are definitely genetic links to, uh, uh, to bipolar disorder. But it is a complicated condition with lots and lots of genes increasing risk. And what tends to happen is each of those genes only confers a tiny little bit of risk. Mm -hmm. So your risk of getting bipolar tends to be higher if you have a number of risk genes, all of which gives you an extra little bit of risk. So it's not it's not a pure inherited thing. So it's not if if you've got a um, even a twin with bipolar, you're not guaranteed that you will have bipolar, let mm -hmm. alone if you've got a parent who's got bipolar. But if you do have a twin, you've got a much increased risk. And if you have got a parent with bipolar again, you have got a significantly increased risk. So you've got an increase, an, an increased risk that you feel is brought on by a trigger, like a life event, or something. Well, we don't fully know, but it could be brought on by um, sort of triggers. Yes, it could mm -hmm. be brought on by life events. Certainly, episodes of illness can be precipitated by life events. Mm -hmm. um, but that may happen because you have got some degree of risk. We've probably all, all of us, every one of us, everybody has got mm -hmm. some risk genes for bipolar. Mm -hmm. It's just that, unfortunately, some people have more of those risk okay. genes, and it's by having a lot of those, and then you have a risk on top of that, you mm -hmm. end up with an episode of illness. Sure. So we're just going to wrap up in the last last 60 seconds, because um, I can see the other guys are ready to come in for their intro. Um, how can people be a part of these studies? Where can they find the links? Lots of people are saying they would love to be involved in a study. How can they get involved? So certainly the ones that Stuart talked about, um, if people go to the website www.mood-now that's a straight line, horizontal mm -hmm. line, disorders.co.uk. It's like the horizontal line in my name, hyphen in my name, right? Mood-disorders.co.uk, um, and there is a link there on current studies. Those are current studies in Newcastle, and there are Great. studies running in other centres as well. Great. Well, it helpful, so just quickly on that, to, to, to direct people to the NIHR, is that, can people find um, it? NIHR do include a list of all of the studies that they've got funded, and you may find other uh, um, studies there. But it's quite difficult to navigate. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. And so everyone that's watching, um, if you would like to share your views on this session or anything else in the conference, then please go on social media and make sure you add the hashtag Let's Talk Bipolar. I'm talking with the guys behind the platform to try and grab um, the questions that we haven't been able to answer in session so we can follow up on our social media channels post event. So thank you very much, Hamish, Stuart and Robert um, for a really informative session. And I hope that everyone watching has enjoyed this time. Thank you. Now we've got our next session coming up, which is looking at uh, attitudes towards bipolar into stigma. And it's going to be hosted by Leah Charles King. So Leah, do you want to, do you want to come and join us now? And then you can introduce your panelists. Hi, Simon. Hi, everyone. Uh, Simon's right, you know, waistcoats definitely are in. Well, Simon rocks them anyway. Um, welcome back, or thank you if you stayed with us uh, since the start of the conference. It's been fantastic so far. I've certainly been enjoying it. My name is Leah Charles King, and welcome to this panel dis discussion called Stigma 
really that is it it's a discussion um i've got a fantastic panel lined up first of all i'd like to introduce uh, one of my fellow uh bipolar uk ambassadors emma bell hello <laughs> hi emma how are you good thank you just had a really great discussion on research and medication so really good and it went really well really did yeah loads yes. of questions <laughs> yes i just had one on tackling mental health stigma in the black asian and mm -hmm. ethnic communities and that went really well as well very interactive and it just shows that there is uh so much thirst for knowledge uh for all there people. is there really is yeah it's great let's get in another one of our bipolar ambassadors bipolar uk ambassadors luando malawo are you there Hello, hi everyone. Hello, gorgeous. Look at her, <laughs> she's just like shining like a star. Hello, oh, thank you so how much. is your conference experience going? It was going great. Um, I was speaking about how to get a diagnosis with um, Dr. Guy um, from Oxford. So he was amazing to give his very uh, maybe clinical and academic um, point of view of things. So it was great, yeah. Excellent. And you and Emma always look so glam, too. I've always got up my game when I know you're about. Likewise. <laughs> Let's get in renowned music producer and another fellow Bipolar UK ambassador, Nikki Chin. Are you with us? Still connecting. He's in there somewhere. Hopefully he'll be joining. And also... Uh, Sarah Owen, who is the co-author of Bipolar Disorder, The Ultimate Guide. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Leah. Hi, it's great to see you. And you. Happy to be here. How is your experience of the conference going so far? Oh, I think it's really fantastic. I listened in to the discussion, men and bipolar, because my eldest son has bipolar. So that's the one I listened into. Really fascinating informative it, it's great isn't it when you see mm. other people coming together who've all been affected whether it's because we live with it or whether uh -huh. it's because of family member and um, so it's great to be here and here he is nikki hello oh, did i miss the whole of the last session <laughs> i don't know what's going on i don't know what's going on i really don't i'm so pleased to be here I'm so uh, glad that you are here. Just don't move. Okay. <laughs> Stay here. So, guys, it's great to have you. It really is. I, I just think I'm so inspired to be part of this today. And I'm sure as fellow ambassadors as well of Bipolar UK, this is just so inspiring of how it started and, and you know, um, why we're doing it. And just hoping that we can make this an annual thing, right? So that we can end the stigma and and next time we have a bipolar conference we don't actually need to be talking about stigma anymore mm -hmm. that would be, be nice great? that um, would be great so, that would be great so let's get stuck stra straight in, in i mean first of all i want to ask what your lived experience of stigma is for me it was of all the stigma that i faced within the community i.e uh, the black community my own uh, friends and family and the thoughts that they would have towards me um, being bipolar but there was no worse stigma than self-stigma I just beat up myself every single day like would just be so angry to still wake up and still be here because this is just the worst thing in the world and I, I just was struggling to live through it and um, I was so embarrassed about what or the thought of what everyone would say. And I held my diagnosis for seven years until I spoke publicly about it on social media. Um, it was a real knee-jerk thing I did. I knew one day I'd do it. Um, I didn't expect it to be the day I did. And I sort of sent this post and I sat back and thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? It's gone now. Um, the response though was overwhelmingly positive. But I know from a conversation I had offline, um, there was still so many things that were said to me that were 
in stigma. So I wanted to know what your lived experience of stigma is, Emma. For me, the biggest stigma, now I look back, I was diagnosed nearly 10 years ago now, and the biggest stigma, in all honesty, was the one that I was placing on myself for needing to take medication. And it got in the way of me taking medication for six or seven months to the point that I was then suicidal, actively being impulsive, putting my life and other people's lives in danger, um, because I had stigmatized medication because I believe that if I needed to take medication it meant that I was a failure in some way that I wasn't able to manage myself um, so actually it ended up putting my life and other people's lives in danger through my own reckless and impulsive behavior due to my mental illness of bipolar so for me that's how stigma showed up personally and really derailed my access into proper help Thank you, Emma. Luanda, what about yourself? Um, mine's a bit of a mix, and I feel quite similar to both of you guys, where my stigma stemmed from myself as well um, about my medication, where I thought it was a race to see how quick I could come off it. <laughs> so mm. I didn't see it as something that was helping me long term. I almost, I think I heard someone describe medication as a cast. So if you break your arm, you wear it temporarily, and then you heal and you take it off and you, you can walk again. So that was my sort of mindset about my mental health. And I feel like very silently, but kind of within my close relationships with my family and friends, where they didn't believe that I was unwell They're like they just felt like you don't need the medication why don't you pray why don't you go to church <laughs> you know that kind of thing um so I think yeah so it's kind of self-stigma as well as with my close relationships it's kind of been it's it's something that people you know I think it's well-meaning that everyone wants to treat me like just the same as everyone else mm. but at the same time you can't, why not, ignore the yeah, issue? Yeah. 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 That was, that's an interesting one, isn't it? You're so right. Um, because I like to be treated like everybody else. But equally, as much as I never really bring up my bipolar at all um, among my close friends and family and things like that, but there is an element in the back of my head that still goes, but don't forget I have a condition. You know, it doesn't just, you know, I don't need to treat me different, but please be mindful that I... I live with bipolar and, you know, sometimes my behaviour isn't 100% perfect, but then, you know, nor is anybody else's. Um, I wanted to bring Nikki in, but he's gone again. Um, let's bring in Sarah, because Sarah, you, your, your son, as you mentioned, has bipolar, right? So you're coming from it from a mother's perspective. Yes, well, my dad had bipolar as well. And he, um, my first experience of stigma was at the age of eight when he became manic and he decided to host a jumble sale in our front garden. And I can remember so clearly being excited that we were holding a jumble sale for charity. And I, but he didn't really have anything to put on the tables that he had out. And he kept on arranging everything. And I can remember as that eight-year-old, the neighbours coming up laughing at him and just feeling so embarrassed and mortified that they were laughing at my dad and I didn't know how to handle that situation. And so that was my first experience of, of being on the receiving end of stigma for a loved one. And more recently, as you say, my son um, was diagnosed during sixth form and he had to have a year off sixth form. And um, luckily he's retired now, but a deputy head at the time said to him in a meeting we had about him going back to school for sixth form, um, he sort of leaned forward and said in a kind of really um, thoughtful way, hmm, maybe um, academic life isn't for you. And, and he, he wasn't asking questions about what we needed for him to go back to school. He didn't have any idea what bipolar was. I think he just thought, um, this is too difficult. Let's just try and remove the problem. And, and to me, that was stigma of the worst kind because it was kind of 
um, pretending to be kindness. And and so I've, I've, you know, it's still very much around. Thank you. Mine, Sarah. by the way. Let's, let's get you in here before you disappear. I mean, before I go out again. Yeah. <laughs> so the, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I mean, you were diagnosed stigma. in 1961. Is that right? I was, was diagnosed like? in 1961. And you want to talk about stigma? My God. My parents were ashamed. I mean, that's where it started off. And um, I was taken out of school at 16. I was a boarding school which I hated anyway. And um, I had a depressive episode followed by a manic episode, um, which allowed my psychiatrist at 16 to diagnose with me with bipolar. And um, the stigma then, as you can imagine, was terrible. When your own family is ashamed, they made me ashamed. Um, I didn't understand what was going on anyway. You know, I had this illness. I didn't know what it was. It, I don't think to this day I've ever been as frightened in my life as I was then because my world fell apart. I didn't know what was wrong with me. And when my psychiatrist said, you've got manic depression, which is what it was called then, of course, shocking name. Um, but actually, it was a relief to be told my illness had a name. So I could say to my friends, I've got manic depression. Now, I knew they didn't know what it was either, but at least I had a label. Um, and that, that meant a lot to me because it said, well, okay, I was ill. Um, and uh, I, to begin with, I didn't think I had an illness. I thought I was going crazy. Um, and uh, to me, that's um, that's what was happening. Um, yeah. and, and it was a shocking time to be. It must have been incredibly no different. One. 1961 to 2021. Um, Nikki, so has your experience of stigma then changed over the decades? And if so, you know, why or how has it changed? Oh, it's changed to the point where, for starters, because I am not a closed book by any stretch of the imagination, um, I am very happy to say to anybody, I've got bipolar. Um, and um, I'm in the music business like you are. Um, and um, I, uh, within my business, I have no problem at all. You know, you're bipolar. It's almost a badge of honor, um, you know, because there are, there are a number of us, a number of writers who are bipolar. Um, so in, the, in, in that business, it's no problem at all. But I find out there, it's no problem at all. I mean, someone may say to me, what's that? Um, and how do you feel about it? And what do you suffer from? Uh, you know, what, 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 what's going through it like? But I will say to anybody out there, I have bipolar and I don't get the reaction of like, well, I should be ashamed of it. Um, the, the, the difference between 1961 and now is staggering, absolutely staggering. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty much an accepted condition. I say to my friends, because I hate it when someone says I understand, because I know they don't. Um, you have to have had it to understand. Um, all I ask of my friends and people who know me is accept it. Accept me for who I am. Don't tell me you understand, because I know you don't, but accept me. This is who I am. You know, what I am as a songwriter, this is who I am. And it is. I, 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 live my life with it. I've been hospitalized um, on a number of occasions. I've written some great songs when I'm hypermanic. Um, you know, I spend too much money when I'm hypermanic. Um, <laughs> I've been in the depths when I'm depressed. Uh, um, you know, uh, I've been through it all. And compared to then and now, now is a pleasure in comparison. 
It really is an absolute pleasure. It has changed so much. So Nikki, but Nikki Garee, for himself, it's changed from 1961 to 2021. Let's bring in someone a, a bit younger, like uh, Luanda, who is coming from the social media age. I mean, now um, there's lots of talk about mental health, but sometimes there's the question of, is it kind of what, you know, the young generation call clout chasing now or yeah. something that's trendy or something that's cool, but are they, you know, really, really wanting to talk about mental illness and the dark side of it. It's all just the really nice, oh yeah, hashtag self care Sunday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what is your experience? Um, what is my experience with? Yeah, of how stigma yeah. has changed. I mean, yeah. do you agree about the whole social media movement at all? I think it hasn't changed much from when I was first diagnosed which was 2014. And I remember what drove me to even share my video, like my story about my um, psychotic episode was because I saw some influences and these social media people talking about, oh, I've got anxiety, I've got depression. Oh, you know, and it wasn't getting into detail, you know, no one was talking about the actual crisis and the reality, the stark reality of it. It was kind of glossed over. But it's, it's, gloss, it's a glossy way to like present it. So I just, it kind of inspired me to do that. And I feel that, you know, even though there's a rise of people putting mental health advocate in their bio and claiming they talk about it, not a lot of people are really sharing the actual ugly side of it, as you said. Um, but, and I'm, I'm finding it still not inspiring enough people to share their, their truth because what I found with young people as well is they create something called a thin stuff. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, and it basically short for fake Insta, <laughs> where oh. they, yeah, they literally talk about their actual mental health on their Finsta page. So they will rather be anonymous. Wow. Or have a secret yeah. page yeah. where they share openly all their struggles. And I found there's a lot of young people still doing that. They would never, Put it on their actual profile. Wow. So my thing is, when I'm with people, I actually advertise it. <laughs> no, I do. I want people to know about bipolar. Yeah, I want them to know. And if it's about it. me, that's fine. The other problem is this, by the way. A lot of people think being high is cool. Yeah. Because they don't know what it's like. They yeah. think, oh, that's cool. High. Oh, I wish I could be like that. No, they don't. No, you They're don't. Over the hypermanic stage. No. No, they don't. No, you don't. <laughs> no. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, so the final question, because we've literally got three minutes. Um, time flies when you're having fun talking about bipolar. Who knew? Um, do you think uh, stigma for people who live with bipolar has gotten better or worse? So Louis already touched on that. Sarah, let's bring you in here. I think it's definitely got better over the years. If I think back to um, my grandfather who had bipolar, like Nikki was saying, um, there was a lot of family shame around the condition, um, a hidden secret maybe that nobody would, people would go to great lengths to hide um, what was happening behind closed doors. Um, whereas now, you know, I'm I'm really proud of my loved ones who have bipolar, my son and my sister, and I'm proud to say they have bipolar and they openly talk about their diagnosis. And so although there's a long way to go, I think times have definitely changed for the better. Sarah, yeah. I have your book as well. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. Which is amazing. The post. That's, That's my the old one. one. That's the old one, but yeah. Oh, okay. There's <laughs> <laughs> new editions, There's new editions. <laughs> I need to keep up. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good read. You. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Emma, what about yourself? Has it has it gotten better or worse for you? In the last ten years, for sure, better. I mean, ten years ago, people weren't speaking out as much. 
openly, not that I could see, certainly not about bipolar. Maybe I heard a lot about depression. And as you know, I ended up in a depression support group and quickly realized that they had no idea what it was like to be hypermanic or manic and experience mania. Um, so I quickly, you know, found a bipolar support group and sitting in there completely lifted shame for me because I was in that group and I people I was telling them what I felt was the ugliest side of my mental health illness and everyone was nodding going yep I get it me too and suddenly I just didn't feel alone and I didn't feel like I was crazy and I felt like I was understood seen and heard and you know that's why I'm happy to be an ambassador now because I'm giving back in the very space that helped me at the beginning you know so yeah, the power of these support groups through Bipolar UK is incredible I feel exactly Absolutely. the same as you, by the way. I'm proud to be an yeah. ambassador. I really, yeah. really am because I'm yeah. giving something back in. Yes, yes. Yeah. I've had Absolutely. a lot of help, a lot of help from professionals, and at last I'm putting something back in. Yes, I feel exactly the same. Yeah. And I definitely feel like having some purpose, like what you're saying, you know, Nikki says he advertises it. He's just yeah. like, yeah, I'm proud, I'm advertising this. <laughs> You know, having some purpose behind the pain yeah. has definitely accelerated my recovery as well. So, yeah. Emma, Luando, Nikki, Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Our time is up. It's just flown by. Um, but it's been a fantastic conference so far. I hope you would join me for our next session of bipolar through the pandemic and that is from 4 till 4 25 and then at 4 30 um myself emma bell and ceo of bipolar uk simon kitchen will all be on diversity radio podcast speaking about the day and how we think it's all gone a bit of a debrief i think so hopefully you will join us and hopefully it'll be very interactive so i'll see you in a moment don't go anywhere Thanks a lot, Leah. That's great. So we've got a five minute break now. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today. I hope you found it really useful and informative and inspiring. We've had some absolutely amazing speakers um, sharing their experiences. And I've, I've really loved hearing about how attitudes have changed to bipolar over the years, most of them for the better. Also some breaking news. So we've had an amazing response from all of you in terms of um, donations. We've raised over three and a half thousand pounds which is brilliant. So I want to say a huge thank you to all of you who have donated um, to, to um, contributing towards the conference next year. So we're almost there. If we can get to £5,000 and we get all the match funding, which the generous donors done. So if you're holding out to find out from another speaker or just wanting to, to see how the day goes, then please do um, bear with us and do, do uh, donate because it'd be amazing if we could get to, to 5000 today and we'll be able to to then kind of confirm that we can do the conference again for next year. So uh, please do donate either through the text donate or through the website as well, which would be amazing. Um, so we're just going to have a, a break now for four minutes and we'll hopefully see you at, at, uh, at 4.30. See you soon.
Hello. Um, so we are back. <laughs> I hope you had a good break just then. So this is now our final uh, panel discussion of the Bipolar UK virtual conference. I hope you've had a great day so far. My name's Leah Charles King. I'm one of Bipolar UK's proud ambassadors. And um, I've had a great day being among you all and having these chats. So let's do this one. It's called Recovering from Mental Health Effects of the Pandemic. I'd like to introduce Professor Alan Young, a Bipolar UK trustee. Hi there, Hi. Alan. How are you? Hi. I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, Dean Clark. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, Dean Clark is a fellow Bipolar UK ambassador. Hello, Dean. Hello. How are we doing? Hi, it's good to see you. Yes, you too, Leah. Thank you. And Mahini Morris is a Bipolar UK trustee. Hi, Mahini. Hi. Uh. Hi, it's great to see you. And likewise. Thank you. And finally, Amanda Saunders, who is co-author of Bipolar Disorder, The Ultimate Guide as well. Is Amanda here? Hi, thanks for having me. Great to be Hi. here. Hi. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so, guys, what an incredible year we've had. And I say incredible because it has so many meanings to that word, doesn't it? Um, something that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime, which was a, a global pandemic. It never crossed my mind. And um, obviously having bipolar and, and just suffering and dealing with that on a daily basis. And when we first went into lockdown, I, at first, it was a bit of a novelty for me. I felt a, a kind of a sigh of relief in a way. I felt like, yes, the world has to stop. Just like me, give me a chance to catch up with everything. I felt like I was so always scrappling to kind of keep up with, with others and um i felt like i was so used to being isolated anyway because of my condition that it kind of didn't bother me in that initial first go and then i would see a lot of news and i'd be consumed by like these pangs of panic and then i'd go to being really nonchalant again so i just wondered what your experience is of uh the pandemic over the last year for you um, let's start with Dean. I was, do you know what? I was a little bit like you, Leah, to be fair. It was, I, I, it kind of, first of all, I was like, oh, this is going to be a little bit of a rest to a degree. I was already going through a transition of actually changing jobs and I was putting my, uh, my job online uh, as a personal trainer and then all of a sudden COVID kicked in and so did 10, 15,000 trainers. So I had that to deal with, but I went through very different lockdowns very very different indeed like the first one i went whoosh, through the roof um it became quite detrimental to, to to my life around that in terms of it um built up a wonderful business in five days and still picking up the pieces now from it um and then the second one was very different in terms of it i was kind of quite flat and then yeah the the, the last one i've it's been very very mixed i've struggled to adapt to this last one um compared to compared to the other two 100 percent. it's funny isn't it like you first one i was a bit like uh, second one i had a bereavement so that shifted from focusing in on the pandemic to obviously then being in, in a state of grief and then the third one being in this now i i struggled myself i found it particularly hard um and but i just didn't know the line of where it was my my bipolar and maybe that everybody else is feeling the same thing and Mahini what was your experiences um so my experience just say so I, I don't have bipolar myself but I have it in my family um but I've obviously been involved in charge for many years and first I just want to say I'm really sorry for your loss um Leah and anyone who's experienced any kind of bereavement over the pandemic whether it's COVID related or not it must have been even tougher than normal um I think mine's been twofold on one hand it's been fairly positive as I have been working on kind of the government's response to the pandemic and while that has been really stressful um, it's just kept me busy in a sense I've had a purpose and I've just been able to kind of motor on and go through it um, from a negative impact and particularly the last lockdown I kind of agree with what you and Dean were saying I think it's been 
really long, really difficult. If you've been in London, you were in tier four for a long time before then. It feels like I've been locked down for many months. And the lack of social interact interaction in my work life and personal life um, has, I think, has re I've really felt it. And it's, ne it's never the same over Zoom, unfortunately. Professor Allen, how have you found it in terms of your your patients, even, or the, the people um, that you're coming across in your field? And have you found it for yourself as well? Well, um, I'll start with work, I suppose. Um, so the first thing was when the lockdown hit, we had to change things dramatically and very quickly. So we put most of our services online. And um, that actually has probably mostly been very successful. So we we, we probably did about five or 10 years um, change in about, well, five or 10 days uh, in terms of actually seeing people remotely. Um, it's not been ideal for everyone. And I do have patients who still prefer to uh, be phoned rather than to do video calls like this. And of course, it's not going to be um, suitable for every occasion because um, you know you can't really assess mania in a in an accident emergency department uh, through Teams or Zoom. But for lots of the routine follow-up, it's been actually very good. And it's also been quite good for lots of the educational events uh, and things like this, where we've actually managed to scale things up. So people can, you know, rather than traveling to London, say, and going to uh, some conference center, people can zoom in from their uh, their homes. So that's been quite good. What happened during the first part of the pandemic was that, you know, it hit at the end of March. And we, we always have a spring, late spring, early summer peak in mania and uh, relapses then. And of course we had that, but we had it, um, uh, you know, with, you know, with rocket fuel uh, added in because lots of people weren't getting their usual care or able to access care. So we had, we had services where we had huge rates of, um, sickness from the staff or people shielding and many of my patients were unable to get help sometimes they were unable to even get basic things like lithium checks and so on and so forth so that's a bit like what people were saying about the you know the early part in april may june last year being a bit frantic then that settled down a bit we got into the telemedicine and the way of doing things a bit better and it worked out really a lot better um but then we've hit it again with having to sort of close things down and uh, again fall back on telemedicine. What I'm hopeful of is that we will incorporate the good things that we've learned and the good techniques, uh, but not necessarily abandon everything from the past. So, um, I mean, I think telemedicine's great, but I think sometimes you have to see people face to face and we should still have a possibility of doing that. Uh, I also think, and uh, Mahimi, Mohini might uh, chip in here. The pandemic's actually been quite good in general for emphasizing uh, the importance of mental health to everybody because I think everybody's mental health has been affected to some extent. I'm not saying that you know we've all had mental ill health, but you know we've all been a bit anxious, a bit concerned, we're aware of social isolation and so on and so forth. I think that's very good. Uh, and there's been a real I think ebbing of stigma and a realization that mental health applies to everybody. What we probably need a little bit more of now is a bit more understanding about specific uh, disorders. And that's where bipolar disorder comes in because I think bipolar disorder is one of the, the most misunderstood disorders and people People very often don't get it and they don't understand it. And, you know, I, I do get colleagues who still um, seem to trivialize bipolar disorder, uh, not not people working in mental health, but other medical colleagues. And it's it's really rather uh, dispiriting when that happens. So, so I think we've seen a big leap forward in terms of general understanding and general sympathy and a realization that we're all in the same boat, but we need to capitalize on this to actually make specific points. 
about uh, about bipolar disorder. And I think Simon and the team at Bipolar UK have been trying to do that. In terms of um, my own personal situation, uh, it's not been particularly bad for me, <laughs> uh, apart from the fact that I've burnt through a few laptops from using them constantly for calls like this. But the but my major concern is more uh, the sort of younger generation, people who've missed schooling, uh, university, uh, the employment crisis. Um, Mahini's very involved in the government response, as she's saying, but I think the economics uh, and the employment rate is going to be very important for young people because a huge determinant of well-being uh, and mental health is, is people's employment status. Um, and hopefully with the vaccines and so on, we'll, we'll see that pick up. I do apologise because I've gone on a bit. So I did ask me so. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Alan. Thank you for explaining all of that. Um, Amanda, let's bring you in here. How have you found uh, the pandemic over the last year? It's It's been pretty difficult um, for my family. Um, I mean, I, I sort of related to what Dean said to start with the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I have cytothemia, so I have to be kind of careful with my mood. You know, I felt quite positive about it. I felt a little bit high, if I'm really honest about it, because it was such a novelty. It felt really, you know, I was kind of into um, yoga. I'm going to kind of meditate my way out of this. But it, 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 it you know, it that was only for a short period of, of, of the kind of pandemic year, really. Um, my mum my mum had bipolar one and as the the pandemic year wore on she found it increasingly difficult to deal with it um to deal with the, the differences in in behaviors and what she what she could do um she had early onset dementia as well which um obviously made things more difficult um in the summer she um had a fall and went into hospital um and and contracted covid there and uh, passed away in November um, and so that's you know been a, a fairly ho horrific thing for our family to go through my, for my mum to be in hospital with bipolar as well was incredibly difficult um, I, I have to say I know there's, there's some amazing health professionals but there were also ones um, in, in, involved with her care who didn't seem to understand bipolar to be honest with you um, and you know, my mum found having the having the oxygen mask on very difficult. She didn't understand the reasons for it. She was she was panicking. Um, her, her, you know, her her um, her moods were, were very difficult to control in that environment. And so she'd take her oxygen mask off. Um, and I, you know, I had a doctor on the phone telling me that that my mum was making a choice not to have the oxygen. Well, that's just not true. That was that's we felt that we had to really fight for her and explain that actually, no, that's her psychosis removing her oxygen mask. That's not her making a choice. Um, I mean, you know, some of her care was very good. We, we It was very difficult. I, you know, we couldn't go, only my dad could go in at the end. We couldn't be with her when she died. Um, and it, it, it has been a, a very, very difficult year. So fact, it's, it's certainly, you know, in, in recent months, it's been quite difficult for me. Um, I've had to be very careful with my mood, but as you mentioned, and I know Leah, you've had a bereavement as well, and you know my condolences to you too. It's a very difficult thing to go through, and, and and grief doesn't grief doesn't have an end point. It's uh, you know I, I find it goes in waves and catches me at different times. Exactly. So it's been it, it's been a really hard year, um, and yeah, I, I you know I, I'm 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 glad to be coming out of it, but it's certainly changed our family forever. And that's exactly what it feels like, isn't it? I lost my grandmother and he was very much like a mother to me and certainly was my best friend. I think um, like you, I, I very much offer my condolences. It's, it's a, to go through COVID and then also, you know, the loss of any loved one is just two together. It's just been heartbreaking. That's a really, really tough thing. Um, so how are you guys now preparing for the end of lockdown? Now that we're able to come out little by little, as of yesterday, we're able now to mix in a group of six, right, outdoors, right? Um, so have you already done that? Have you already been out um, among uh, groups of people? Yeah, have you celebrated it? How are you preparing for it? And do you have any concerns? Dean, let's start with you. 
Yeah, I think primarily, um, it's hopefully this will help everybody, but like we have a government roadmap as such as an exit, but you're going to have to start making individual ones. Um, everybody's different, but the thing about it is, is it's, it is, uh, I, I believe I'm going to be really honest. I think it's going to be a lot tougher than what we expect. Um, and it's going to be a complete uh, different uh, level of emotions going on, coming out of this for, for a number of reasons. <laughs> We don't get along with uncertainty very well, which brings me kind of onto my next point is that in terms of planning, you can plan for certainty. Um, and and that myself is what I try to get people at the minute to do around me, especially people like coaches, plan for certainty, even it's the little things. So if it's the case of doing everything you can now um, to make that time just a little bit easier. If you're somebody that runs a social media platform, preload your posts up before you do it. Do your content now. If you're going to be going back from furlough, start getting into that routine now. It's going to be a struggle. Don't leave it to the last minute. Um, going straight into it, we've got to also be fully aware that it's going to be difficult. There, like, I look at it as a second stage that you're going to endure some form of hardship. And obviously, thank you for both being so honest and open about your losses over over COVID because it'll be it it'll be really relatable also for people, including myself. So it's going to be coming in terms of that kind of enduring that stage. Um, and you're going to have to start adapting, um, strategize, continuously be versatile because that's where you have to be around uncertainty. And that's going to come as well. I wish I could hold my hand up and say it's not. But the ultimate goal is, 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 is what I call say is just thriving within the situation. And um, that doesn't necessarily mean you might actually enjoy certain situations as such, but Let's just look at the other lockdowns really quickly. Um, we're extremely resilient because resilience is development. So it doesn't necessarily, it's going to be the most enjoyable time, but we adapted and many people, everybody listening in has adapted in some way to free national lockdowns, loss, adversity. It's going to be a process you're going to have to go through again. But yeah, in summary, start planning now and just take those small marginal gains going into that roadmap and make your own personal individualized roadmap. Step by step and just like you say, prepare. And Mahini, what about yourself? We, we've literally, we've got about five minutes left of this. So how are you preparing for the end? Um, so I am definitely making tentative plans um, in terms of, um, the dates and then things that I can do um, I think Dean's advice is awesome I think everyone should have their own roadmap um, and living with uncertainty is really hard um, just to bring on to Alan's point I think my main concern is really about the longer term impacts we know from previous recessions that there has been an increase in suicide linked to unemployment what happens when sectors reopen um, government is doing things like furlough but um you know, there will be gaps and there will be impacts. So I think that is yet to be really, really seen. So that's my main concern, really. Thank you, Mahi. And Alan, yourself? How do, you, how do you feel like some of your patients or advice that you could give about preparing to come out of lockdown now? Well, I mean, I guess um, we've got to be aware that the late spring and early summer are, are vulnerable times for people going by anyway. And so just to be extra cautious to, to follow the advice about early warning signals. Um, you know, there's a, there'll be a real temptation to, to join the party, I suppose, but you've got to be very careful about that, especially with things like uh, alcohol and so on. Uh, and hopefully people will be able to negotiate this difficult time. Um, I'd like to echo what Dean says about resilience, because you know we talk about we talk about stress and so on, and, so, and that's all very important. But resilience is also uh, something. That I think there's been tremendous resilience shown by lots of people, and I, you know, some of my uh, my patients have just shown outstanding resilience for sort of coping with uh, with looking after you know being being unwell themselves, looking after sick sick parents, sick children, and having social isolation and so on. So we should really think about the good factors and the strengths that we have and try and build upon those. But but hopefully, hopefully we'll all have a reasonably nice summer. I hope so. Good point. Thank you, Alan. And yourself, Amanda? Um, I'm kind of torn between two two kind of impulses about about coming out of lockdown. I, I, I mean, I love going to the theatre. I love going to live events, I love live music. 
cannot wait to get back to, to those kind of things. But I do feel a, a sense of nervousness as well. You know, I mean, I, I, um, I work in central London and normally commute in every day. Um, and although I'm sure I'm going to be continuing to do some remote working from home, I am going to have to commute in. And I, I can feel myself getting stressed about that. And I can feel, you know, we, we've been in this kind of we've literally been in bubbles for the last few months. And actually being able to kind of come out of that is, a, you know, um, it, 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 it's going to be a different experience. It seems such a long time since we've moved into this new world and adapting to it. I know, I know a number of my friends are, are quite um, nervous about thinking about going out and being with people again. And I think it's good to acknowledge that. And as Alan says, just take it easy. Don't feel compelled we have to rush in and do everything just because it's all there and available. I think we have to, particularly in bipolar, really think very carefully about what's good for us and, and kind of manage our manage our sort of return to kind of normal life again and, and be really careful about that. That's something what I'm going to do. Do you know, I think you're right. For me, I am really excited about the summer. Like Alan said, I'm like, especially a beautiful day like today, I'm like, yes can't wait to go out and see my family and particularly i haven't seen anybody uh, for months now um but i'm concerned about things like using the tube in the summer when you know in the winter using the tube whenever i had to go out to work i was covered i've got cut jumpers like everything apart from a mask so i was well with a mask sorry so i was completely covered now i'm thinking of little things it's like it'll be summer my skin will be exposed I will feel more exposed and then if I eat out and enjoy some time with friends do I want to touch things or think things be you know would it be contagious you know all of these sort of thoughts are going through my head and um it's it I, I think definitely it's going to be a journey for us all we've all had to adapt in some kind of way and um I think the proof is in the pudding of how we come out of this because we don't really we can have all the best laid plans in the world isn't it but until we actually start doing it and living it and trying to come out of it we're just not going to know um so professor alan young dean clark mahini morris amanda saunders thank you so much for being here amanda where can we get your book by the ultimate guide uh, it's available on Amazon. Um, it's available on our, on our publisher's website, One More Publications. But if you search for it on Amazon, you sh you'll find it. Perfect. Thank you so, Thank you. so much. And to the rest of you, have a great day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, so that's it. I think possibly I should be handing back over to uh, our CEO, Simon, um, to say some final words, I would imagine. Um, and then join us as we will be going on to Diversity Radio podcast. Hello, Simon. Hi, Leah. How have you found the day so far? It's been amazing day hasn't it i'm so proud to be part of this and so happy we pulled off it's been many months we did, yeah yes yeah, so it could have it could have gone a lot worse couldn't it so that's good and um i really love dialing in and, and listening to all the different speakers so um thank you so much for, for doing so much of the hosting today Leah. It's, it's um it's been amazing and um you've got a really good way of keeping people keeping people on topic as well it's not easy oh, at all you. got such a big panel and um keeping the discussions going. So well done on that. We're really oh, grateful for your, for your help on it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And um, thanks for everything that you're doing. So congrats on a great day. And I'll see you over on the Diversity Radio podcast in a bit. Bye. Brilliant. See you soon. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you so much for sticking with us for the for the entire day or well, the afternoon. Um, apologies. I know someone was, was unwell on, on the chat and uh, we've had to remove them. Um, but just to let you know that people do say stuff that they really regret when they're unwell. We're a charity of second chances, so we'll be reaching out to that individual to make sure that they get the support that they need. Uh, but obviously, we can't ever tolerate anyone saying anything rude and upsetting to any of our any of our speakers and to our rest of our community. So, um, so they will be getting support. But we're sorry that we had to to remove them. So it's been a it's been a really amazing day, hasn't it? So we we've launched the bipolar commission at the start of the day. Clearly. Uh, as a as a cause, we have a lot of work to be doing, but it's a, it's it's work that's vital to be done. We can't sit back. We know that within our community, the rate of suicide is horrendous, but we also know from hearing all the speakers that we've had today that it, it is possible to live well with bipolar. 
And by working together and by launching our commission and, be, and being effective campaigners and not taking no for an answer and really building on the amazing stories that we've heard here today, that we can do it. It is very realistic. Over the next year, we can get the evidence base together that we need to be able to transform the lives of people with bipolar. And then the five years after that, we can put in place a plan that we can deliver to make sure that no one in, in society should die from bipolar. Um, I'd like to say some a lot of thank you. So uh, obviously a big thank you to Leah for doing an amazing job chairing so many of the sessions. Uh, a big thank you to Anna, who's been organising so much of it. So um, she's been um, a, a real rock here, kind of fielding everyone's emails and organising it and so forth, which is brilliant. So thanks, Anna. And she also organised the conference last time. So she's a real, real kind of dab hand at this now. Um, a huge thank you to all of our speakers and our, and our presenters. Um, it just shows the kind of real wealth of insight and talent that we've got within our community, both in terms of policy and in terms of academia, and also the kind of the, the really varied lives and talents of, of people li living with bipolar and their close friends and family. Uh, it really gives me strength and comfort to know that as we go forward as a charity, that we've got so many wonderful people who are coming along there with us. Um, I'd also like to say a big thank you to our donors. So we've had uh, we've had an enormous response um, to, to our appeal. We hope that we were going to fundraise the money to be able to put on the conference next year. And I can say that we've hit our target. So um, we needed to raise, we want to raise £10,000 today so that we could commit to it going forward. And um, we've had, with a match funding, we've had well over that. So we've had a number of people who, someone really generously donated £1,100. So that £1,500, which is an incredible donation. So thank you so much for that. Another person donated five hundred pounds, and we're just getting through the um, getting through the actual final figures for the other ones. Those of you who donated even five pounds, it makes a massive difference to us as a charity. So we're incredibly grateful, and I think it's a real powerful statement that all of us coming here together made the commitment to meet up again this time next year, and we put the we put the money forward to be able to do that. So well done um, to to all of us for doing that. So. I can say that next year we will be doing another bipolar virtual conference and we'll be getting back, and back all of the speakers who we've had here um, and more as well. We want to make it bigger and better. Um, so you'll get a couple of emails of, from us over the next couple of days. You'll get one uh, which is around the Bipolar UK, um, the, the commission survey, which is looking at diagnosis and triggers. This is for people who have had a diagnosis. So um, those of you who are kind of pre-diagnosis, and uh, friends and family carers. There will be future surveys for you as well, but this is just for people with a diagnosis um, or people completing it on behalf of someone with a diagnosis. So we really look forward to, to having your input and to hearing your stories. So that'll be going around hopefully tomorrow, it might be the day after, uh, but it's ready and we'll, we'll, we'll get it out to you as soon as possible. And also we will be sending around an email with the, uh, when we've downloaded all the Zoom, um, the the all of the the Zoom um, recordings, so you're able to catch up if you weren't able to to watch all the sessions you wanted to. And obviously, we will be asking for more money because if we can get more money in, then we'll be able to invite more people to this conference. I, I, I don't know how many people we've ended up dialing in today. We'll find out soon. But we've we've had at least four thousand people registered for this session, and I'm sure a catch up it will probably end up being a lot higher as well. So our ambition next year is if we can get ten thousand people to come along to this, that would be an amazing achievement. And we would really love it to be able to get people from all across the UK with bipolar and their close friends and family to, to, to be joining us. So if you have heard what you've, you've seen, what you've seen today, you've enjoyed it, you want other people with bipolar to share in it, then do, um, if you want to donate some money over the next few days, then we would love to hear from you because we know that we can get thousands more people to, to enjoy what we've enjoyed here today. Thank you so much. Um, and um, please do use our services, come to our website, We've got our Corvac service, our e-community and our support groups. Everyone who's affected by bipolar, it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what, what kind of religion or ethnicity you've got. Everyone's affected by bipolar equally and everyone can benefit from, from the services that we provide. So you are very, very welcome. Please do come and join us. Um, it's going to be great. We're going we're gonna to have a really great year and we're going to deliver an amazing commission. And we're going to see the transformations that we deserve for people with bipolar. So have a lovely evening and I hopefully see you again next year.